I got this right because the moment Biden took over, I in a podcast said, "Boss, कुछ तो होने वाला है." भाई ये कैसे चलेगा? Just buy one barrel and put it in three different things. No, yeah. no, they don't want to do that. And the Russians are just using old crappy tanks, which you know in the second-hand market would be like fifty thousand dollars. American congressmen are extremely well informed. Right. You can't lie. The following is a conversation with the renowned geopolitical expert and analyst Abhijit Ayer Mitra, who is renowned for his extremely outspoken and very accurate geopolitical views. So subscribe now and enjoy the conversation. Abhijit Ayer Mitra, welcome to the Abhijit Chawda podcast. It's wonderful to have you on again. Abhijit Chawda, thank you for having Abhijit Ayer Mitra on the <laughs> podcast. It's wonderful be uh, to be here again. This time in person. In person, yes. We did a we did a virtual podcast once. Yes, it's a long time ago. So let's discuss geopolitics and other matters. Ah. Yeah, and and let's start with the 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 event that's uh, capturing the world's attention, which is the Ukraine conflict. Mm. So, what's your assessment of how the Ukraine conflict is progressing? I mean, uh, there are lots of views out there on social media and other other places. Mostly, the Western media will tell you that the Russians are losing. They have been losing since day one, mm. and and uh, obviously the line the battle lines have kind of uh, yeah. stabilized. There's not much to and fro, fourth uh, movement going on. So, what's your ass- assessment of what's happening? Who's really winning? So, first of all, you need to know I got this right and I got this badly wrong. Okay. I got this right because the moment Biden took over, I, in a podcast, said, "Boss, कुछ तो होने वाला है." Okay. Because Trump could kind of manage Russia, hmm. even though he's the one that exacerbated the problem. He's the one that started supplying arms to the Ukrainians, which hmm. wasn't done before. Hmm. I got it wrong in that I. definitely did not think the russians were going to invade when they did when the americans were saying so one because and of course this is you know uh, uh, not parallax error it's kind of you're so adamant that a source is tainted mm. you will not accept it because you know after weapons of mass destruction and yes. uh, you know the uh, sarajevo uh, uh, mortar shelling mm. which was very conveniently organized by the bosniaks uh, when christian amanpour was in town yes the market shelling which killed 72 people which then led to the thing i'm generally i will listen to the americans and the brits but i will not take it on board mm-hmm. and at that time the israeli all my israeli russian german friends were telling me boss we're not doing anything mm-hmm. i called up my guys in the kremlin they're like boss hum kuch nahi karne wale hain of course they went in the loop they went trying to deceive me uh-huh. they were in the loop mm-hmm. i did not lose my job but the head of french intelligence did lose his job <laughs> okay that said i made a second mistake which was i thought ki boss ye तीन दिन में खत्म हो जाएगा रीप्लेइंग क्राइमिया एंड क्लियरली इट वॉज इंट बिकॉज द अमेरिकन से डन अ वेरी वेरी गुड जॉब ट्रेनिंग एंड नाउ यू अंडरस्टैंड वाई पुतिन डिड वॉट ही डिड बिकॉज इट वॉज यू ईदर गो इन नाउ और इट्स गोन बिकम टू लेट बिकॉज ऑफ ऑल द ट्रेनिंग एंड दी uh weapon supplies and things i think he did severely underestimate like all of us mm-hmm. uh well some of us at least me uh, at least uh, underestimated the ukrainian will to resist and fight okay so that is what happened now with the massacres before we get to what's happening right now with the massacres bucha is one of those things where for me the jury is still out okay because again you know i would rather uh, i would rather repeat my mistake of not listening to american and british sources mm. rather than believe someone like bellingcat which you know is a shill that's got uh, uh, you know uh, which is funded entirely by the state department and yes. allied uh, uh, whatever and you know how they've tried to completely uh, 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 bullshit about the white helmets in syria and the chemical attacks their their reports have been called out mm-hmm. several times now mm. so now what is happening as i see it is that uh, russia doesn't have it easy they're in deep sorry to use the word but shit deep shit sure uh the problem is the ukrainians are in deeper shit mm-hmm. right because russia still hasn't done a full mobilization yes it's mobilized some people mm-hmm. it has not mobilized uh its major reserves which it can call on mm-hmm. ukrainian on, uh, ukraine on the other hand is fighting with everything it has yes mm-hmm. um my real worry about bucha uh, sorry about uh, bakhmut which is where we're stuck right now is one why is it stuck on that one town i Indeed. mean you've got almost a 7 800 km long uh, border yes why is all the fighting just happening in bakhmut and mm. this is where you go back to the um, french vietnam war the indochina war mm-hmm. not the vietnam war the indochina, indochina. war mm-hmm. uh, uh, with the french and dien bien phu mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. where you know the French commander he wanted to lure for new and chap into uh, what is called a hammer on the anvil strategy mm-hmm. Ki, so a hammer on the anvil like if you uh, a picture it there's a thick uh, log on which the anvil is kept yes and uh, when you're shaping metal you heat it you cool it and you hammer it you heat it you hammer it and then you cool it and that's how you build up the strength of steel with the carbonization and mm-hmm. everything and what happens is uh, it is more likely uh, because this is metal and the hammer is metal but the handle of the hammer is not metal yes. it is uh, wood, wood. Yeah. it is more likely the wood will crack first than the thick stump of wood on which the anvil is kept hmm. and the belief then is that you become the anvil you allow the other to become the hammer so you absorb a lot of blows hmm. uh, but ultimately the first thing that is going to crack 100% guarantee is the handle. Uh, handle yes now who is the anvil and who is the hammer in bucha hmm. well if you notice the russian Bakhmut. panic in bakhmut yes uh, the russian Panic withdrawal, you know, that 70 kilometers in the space of two, three days when uh, all the story was in September last year, Mm. that the Russian front has collapsed Mm -hmm. and they're withdrawing very rapidly. I personally believe that the Russians are the anvil and I think that's uh, kind of bearing out. There's only one square kilometer of uh, Bakhmut left to capture. Yes. It's been a heavy meat grinder in terms of Russian lives, but significantly greater in Ukrainian lives. Um, Now... What happens from here, we don't really know because a collapse in Bakhmut could be catastrophic Mm -hmm. because you've thrown so many troops in there. You've gambled so much on just one city. Mm -hmm. Now, they keep talking about this Ukrainian counteroffensive coming. They've been announcing it for months. They've been announcing it for months. Uh, You know, the thing is, we have access to OSINT. We lost all our direct OSINT access within a few weeks of this starting. Right. Because all the subscribers that we pay to said, uh, sorry, you're all being cut out. You can see whatever you want, just not Ukraine. Okay. And OSINT has played a very, very important role in this. Because see, the Americans were, and whole of NATO, uh, were giving the Ukrainian satellite imagery. Yes. The problem is raw satellite imagery requires a lot of training to interpret. So the yeah. Ukrainians didn't know what was happening out there. Mm. So they tapped upon all these Twitter and internet uh, OSINT operators to interpret and give real-time targeting data to the Ukrainians, mm. which is why it was lethal. Mm. It turned out sometime immediately after that September reversal, September last year reversal that the Russians faced, that 70 kilometer withdrawal. The Russians had infiltrated those OSINT networks and they were also receiving the exact same analysis that the Ukrainians were receiving. Okay. Mm-hmm. Which is why it's stabilized as mm-hmm. well. Uh, otherwise, the Ukrainians would have overrun the Russian positions. Because you remember, there were S-400 and very sophisticated radars that were being left behind by the Russians. Yes. Almost a panic withdrawal in that sense. Mm-hmm. So that's what happened out there. Uske baad kya hua ki there was... Um, uh, basically the hammer on the anvil sets in, which is a very slow, long, drawn out, nasty urban warfare. Like we saw, you know, in the first and second Chechen wars. Mm, yes, uh, yes. The first Chechen war, of course, that idiot Pavel Grachov was in charge. Uh, he had more Mercedes than any known man. <laughs> like he had more Mercedes than Osho had Rolls Royces. <laughs> uh, all gifts, apparently. Mm. And he was sacked. And then the second war was won at a very heavy cost over two, three years. Yes. I think that's what we're settling into. We're looking at a four-year war. Okay. Uh, a lot of the Russians are telling you, you know, it's going to collapse. Mm. Uh, the Ukrainian front is going to collapse. I'm not seeing that. Because what we're seeing is Ukrainians are getting supplies. Uh, our coverage right now is patchy. Because, you know, we're like beggars. Mm. We're like, hey, Baba, de-de, khuda ke baas, de, paisa de, de. we're like, oh, sint de, de. Oh, sint de, de, yeah. uh, and we get some stuff. We're not seeing Ukrainian mobilization. Hmm. Uh, we did, well, any significant concentration. We are seeing mobilization, but not concentration of forces right. required for a counteroffensive. Uh, on the Russian side, it's very curious. We've seen at least three force concentrations because we can still look at Russia. Hmm. The problem is, what are those force concentrations doing? Yes. Like, you know, there's this... Uh, a sea of Azov port called Novorossiysk, mm-hmm. which is where a huge, huge uh, mobilization was going on. Okay. And we're like waiting for it to get transferred to Crimea and then through the Kerch Straits and the uh, bridge and everything. Nothing. Okay. And we don't know what's happening because, you know, if Bakhmut is one of those places where you want to concentrate the forces, you would suspect, I mean, imagine this mic is Bakhmut. 
you'd want to then do a pincer movement around them around. and attack them from the back. Mm. Right? No, not done. And it's very stupid in my opinion because you're literally waiting for Ukraine to be rearmed throughout. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's reports now that the Ukrainians are training on F-16s and those enter the war. Okay, yeah. Um, so that's the situation as it stands. We're not seeing any movement. Of course, there's lots of lessons for India in this. Yes, indeed. Which I don't think we're taking on board. I think we're learning all the wrong lessons from it. What lessons do you think need to be learned? The first is, you know, this absolute atrocious quality of Russian, Russia's ISR complex, mm -hmm. intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance mm -hmm. complex. They're not able to detect and destroy even before it reaches the battlefield. Mm -hmm. You will never see an American, French, UK or Israeli military campaign where the front line is even allowed to reach them anymore. Right. They destroy all your hard equipment beforehand. Uh, there, there are no tank battles. The tanks go in when, uh, I mean, even remember the Hezbollah, the anti-Hezbollah campaign in 2006, mm. uh, you know, it was counted as a failure. It turned out to be the biggest strategic victory of the uh, Israelis because it's brought them peace for a longer period of time mm. than ever before. Right. Even though it's classified as an operational failure, mm. they lost about 10, 15 Merkava tanks in that. Okay. Mm. Right. Whereas the Russians have lost hundreds of vehicles so far. So, you know, the Western intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance complex is just way ahead. Right. That time sensitive, the ability to detect and destroy on the spot, way ahead. Uh, electronic warfare, way ahead. Mm -hmm. The ability to operate air power with impunity, way ahead. Mm -hmm. So, Russian equipment may be cheaper. What you keep getting from the Indian Air Force is, yaar, sasta hai, kaun itna dega? Now, this is... See, I understand if you live in Delhi, like we are at the moment, and you're driving in city traffic, uh, buying a Mercedes is a, especially an AMG Mercedes, is stupid. Mm -hmm. What an AMG Mercedes can do, a Baganar can also do. Right. Okay. But if you go to that Delhi Mumbai highway, uh, where, uh, you know, your, which is now only up to Dosa on the Jaipur route, uh, uh, four or five lanes on each side. Mm -hmm you need an AMG. Right. Because you can literally do Delhi to Jaipur in one hour and 27 minutes. I'm not going to tell you who, but a friend of mine did Delhi okay. to Jaipur in one hour and 27 minutes. I see. <laughs> there you need an AMG. Hmm. Now, they presume everything is going to be like a Rusi equipment. Chal jayega. Okay. But remember, even in Balakot, they didn't use the Sukhois. They used Maybe the French the Mirage 2000s. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Hmm. Whereas the Sukhoi was meant to be your deep penetration and strike aircraft. So there is a certain... Like Stalin used to say, you know, quantity has a quality all of its own. Yes. So there is a quality side of the debate and the quantity side of the debate. I don't think we get that. Mm -hmm. We haven't decided which side we want to go. Uh, the problem is multi-sourcing too, too many calibers, too many weapons, which means you, you don't create economies of scale. You yes. can't indigenize. You can't create local weapons assembly lines. Even something, you know, the one thing that this... Uh, grinding meat grinder battle has shown us is the importance of artillery. Mm, yes. Not tanks, artillery. Yes. Everything is artillery on this kind of a battlefield. Yes. You're not taking your artillery seriously. Mm. You've bought a different uh, toad howitzer for your army. You want a different wheeled howitzer for your army. And you want a different tracked howitzer for your army. Just buy one barrel and put it in three different things. No. Yeah. No. They don't want to do that. Okay. And you know, each caliber is suited to a specific kind of thing. It's yes. it's even though it'll say NATO standard 155 mm. You know, the original operator ka equipment will always work better than a hack that you do. Like a purpose, like for example, my, um, let me just take this out. My iPhone will sync perfectly with my Mac, 100%. Yes. My Android will kind of sync with my Mac, but not as well as it. Not as well as this one. This one, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and similarly with a, say, a Chromebook. I don't mm. know if they do Chromebooks anymore. I but uh -huh. but uh, how that would work with Android. Guys. Yes. Ammunition and this thing is like that. Mm. So, you know, of course, it will do the job. But will it do the job perfectly? No. No. So, you know, you want to get that one gun, uh, have massive production lines out here, standardize everything on 155 mm. They're not looking at it. Mm. You know, we're, we're still looking at an Air Force fleet of five to seven different types of aircraft. Yes. Uh, there's going to be one new tactical fighter, TBDEF. There is going to be uh, the next development of uh, Tejas. There is going to be the original uh, Tejas. 
there is going to be the Sukhoi 30, there is going to be uh, the uh, Rafale, mm. then there is going to be Amka. Amka, yeah. Now you tell me, even a superpower like America has only three fighter types. Yes. Uh, four. Uh, uh, two for the Navy, two for the Air Force. Mm. Right? So F-16 and F-15 for the Air Force. Uh, which uh, the F-16s are all going to be replaced by the F-35, so that's going to come down to two. F-15 they might not replace. Uh, and for the Navy, F-18 plus F-35. Right. So they're down to three models, basically. I mean, uh, different variants of the F-35 model, but basically three variants. You look at, uh, uh, you know, uh, Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll Technically, they're only using two big fighters. I mean, they've got the MiG-31 and the Sukhoi-25 for close-in, but that's because it's quite an obsolete Air Force, as you're seeing in what they can do compared to the West. Israel may only two, three kinds of aircraft. Yes. Japan, Korea, just two, three kinds of aircraft. Uh, France, just one kind of aircraft. Yes. Because they're the retiring all their Mirage 2000s. Yes. Why are you going for six? Hmm. You know, where, where is this appetite for luxuries coming from? Hmm. Uh, because it complicates the logistics chain horribly. Yes. Hmm. Uh, we haven't learned that. Hmm. Uh, we haven't learned that the effectiveness of Western weapons comes on based on that ISR complex. So you have to invest heavily in electronic warfare, in active spying, in constant surveillance, in you know picking up new signals and converting them to the jamming frequencies, developing your own electronic warfare program, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a good electronic warfare pro program, not HAL. Though HAL has had some successes. You know, the radar warning receivers very good. They've managed to eliminate a lot of the false positives that were coming and things like that but okay. the jammer is a completely different ball game hmm. especially you know now that you have gallium arsenide and hmm. gallium nitride and all those things coming in the way of jamming them the frequencies and things very exotic frequencies you know you have you you need very sophisticated electronics to do that which we don't have hmm. i mean we don't spend that much on r d and things like that you know we waste things on bureaucratic uh, uh, crap because hal i mean look uh, for everybody, I know all our audience are going to say Mote, Ganje, Takle, uh, Kamine, what not, uh, mm. nonsense. You tell me, when has a bureaucrat run the finance ministry or the defense ministry or the home ministry or the, any ministry properly? No, it's not happening. Do you trust the IAS? Mm. Then why do you trust the ISS, which is the Indian Science Service? I mean, I, I made that up. But these are essentially babus. Yeah, they are, yeah. In their mind, they are IAS officers. Mm. Okay. Why would you trust them? Okay, uh, what is the what have we managed to pull off so far that is so mind-bogglingly astounding or good? Nothing. 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 So why? So I don't think we've learned the lessons. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of um, daydreaming. Are Russians jeet they, They'll only watch those Russian propaganda handles on Twitter. Mm. They're not watching the Ukrainian. See, for me, you take the two extremes and then you... Yeah, you synthesize it. You synthesize it. Now, they're like, Russia is going to win. Russia has already won. Oh, you don't know. They're already outside Kiev. Boss, they were outside Kiev like nine, ten months back. A year ago, and then, yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, but this is how it happens. Mm. So there's nothing you can do about it. But I don't think we've learned... Uh, you know, even, you know, this depending on the West for supplies, you know, the quality of the javelin, the quality of uh, uh, all those Western shoulder fired anti-tank missiles, which are deadly effective, is based on accurate targeting information. Mm, yes. They are meant to be used as a system of systems when they are not. This is the biggest takeaway from the Ukraine war. When Ukraine is using them not in a system of systems, but individually to take out tanks. You expend so much of them that you need great quality in great quantity, which yes. you cannot afford. Mm. Which is why the West can't keep up with the demand. Yeah. yeah. And the Russians are just using old crappy tanks, which, you know, in the second hand market would be like $50,000 <laughs> mm. to absorb missiles that will cost $100,000, $120,000, uh, $200,000 and things like that. Yes, yes. Mm. So, you know, the economy of effort principle of war doesn't make sense. Mm, right. So, a lot. Uh, we need to learn in terms of how to balance this quantity versus quality debate, how to balance, uh, you know, uh, using uh, quality in a not system of systems, make our choice what you want to use. I mean, if you want to go to the Russian uh, path, 
are you willing to lose 30 40000 soldiers and fight a long war for one two years yes right uh, are you willing to see the chinese troops come in and do massacres like bucha and things like that mm. are you willing to uh, uh, you know uh, give up you know uh, 25% of your territory to create those defensive lines inside and things like that mm. i think not yeah uh, then do you want to move to the western thing oh we can't really trust the west you know the west is out to get us mm. by they're out to get everybody that's right yeah okay mm. but how did korea japan manage to get their technology uh, from them and screw them mm. they're now defeating them in all kinds of international competitions and markets right mm. they've definitely got a technological edge which is significantly greater than china mm. or north korea mm. or turkey's got a very significant export industry now they've developed it quite well yes right uh uh certainly more than greece their mm. arch enemy or any of their middle eastern neighbors except israel right because israel got into the game much earlier much earlier for sure uh and they focused on subsystems uh turkey is focusing on platforms mm. the israelis focused on subsystems they still buy their systems and they fit their own systems into them which act as the force multiplier the electronic warfare the weapons and things like that we're not learning those lessons i think we're drawing all the wrong lessons from it mm -hmm. and there's another dimension to this which is the drones they have been using drones a lot for swarming and and overwhelming the enemy we saw that in the azerbaijan uh, conflict as well uh, is india focusing on drones has india dro dro you know learned that lesson i'm not too sure mm -hmm. you know there was a particularly clueless article that came out about a week or two weeks back saying ukraine shows us that drones are irrelevant really I'm really sitting there going <laughs> bhai ye thankfully not written by an indian no? some gora wrote okay it. i'm going dude like i mean i don't know what ecstasy or mmda pill you're on mm. but i sure as hell don't want that where is the urgency in arming drones where is the urgency see you've seen so much innovation in drone warfare yes we saw the so called footage of a ukrainian drone taking out a uh, ukrainian helicopter drone taking quadcopter drone taking out a russian quadcopter drone hmm. it was like two kids fighting you know those <laughs> uh, uh, paper hats and wooden swords kind of fight uh, it was childish hmm. but you look at the way the ukrainians have used those quadcopter drones to precisely take a small rpg shell and drop it exactly on a tank yes pling uh, i know the army here for example when they were told that we can provide you with these drones they said ye yeah, what can we do with a 3 4 kilo warhead hmm. like have you seen what the ukrainians have been doing with those 3 4 kilo rpg warheads because hmm. remember the top of the tank is always the least protected Indeed, yes. so you know to give a simple example to our viewers imagine this is armor okay now i have without doing anything i just tilt it i have not increased the weight but before the shell had to just come in here and go through this just by tilting it i have doubled the thickness now the shell has to travel all the way to hit me on this side right so things like sloping armor yeah. you know the kind of sophisticated reactive armor that you're seeing which dissipates the kinetic energy of the uh, incoming blast and things the top is the only unprotected part right and they're using it very 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 well they used the bayrat cars to great effect in the beginning of the war yes till the russians found countermeasures and screwed the bayrat cars over i mean you know have you noticed in this war the west has been claiming so many things as wonder weapons wonder weapons wonder weapons and russia seems to find a counter to every one of them it takes time it takes time it yeah. takes a month and a half two months but Some they damage. find yeah, yeah. They, and they absorb that damage they so absorb you have to have that so if you want that russian method of warfare you got to be willing to take 30 40000 uh, dead you're willing to per year you're willing to accept 7 800000 tanks uh, or armored vehicles destroyed per year kind of thing etc uh, etc uh, et so uh, this and then where the russian genius comes in is that uh, they buy these super cheap iranian drones yeah the shahed do yeah with just like what 2 3 kilo warheads which are kind of like our harpy drones which we bought at bloody god knows what 100 times the cost mm. because we bought it much earlier also mm. uh, this is you know uh, it's democratized uh, what the chinese have done to the mobile phone the iranians have done to the uh, 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 loitering attack drone right uh, and you know these days even with cameras like you know your sasta uh, home security cameras that you get for 2 3000 rupees mm. 
they're very good quality. I mean, they're sufficient quality that uh, you can fit it onto a drone for two, three thousand rupees, do the targeting and plonk a tank. The Russians have been using it very, very, very well. So all we're seeing now is the Russians using these Shahid 3 or 2, I forget, and uh, scoring victories to which the Ukrainians have not been able to come back yet. I mean, we've seen them, you know, using shoulder-fired missiles to shoot them down while they're flying. Yes. Some of them have been getting that. Now, AK-47 shooting down drone, very good idea. Hmm. Stinger missile costing <laughs> about a million dollars a pop. Yeah. Shooting down a 30,000 rupee... Um, you know, that's like a Wagonar crashing into a Mercedes S-Class and the wagon uh, and the S-Class saying, main jeet gaya, main jeet gaya, even though because of his crumple zone. You know, the wagon R uh, owner might have suffered a few cuts here and there. But ultimately, the Mercedes crumple zone would have absorbed the entire crash. So the Mercedes is completely totaled. Hmm. The wagon R might not have suffered that much after all. I mean, you don't really know. I mean, I haven't seen a wagon R. <laughs> I'm just modeling this in my mind. Hmm. Maybe hyperbolistic, but... Uh, you get the image. The economics don't make sense. Right. Uh, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. And and what about the Turks? They have developed entire platforms of these drones. The, we have the Kizil Elma that's come out now, which is a stealth drone. Uh, I mean, a very large one. How come they are able to make these advances and we are not doing that? Because they did something very, very smart. They chose to buy one thing in large quantities, keep slowly, slowly, slowly improving the same product, which we never did. Hmm. Remember, we got the uh, NAT, which the NAT. then became the Marut, I think. Marut, uh, yes. Right. Uh, and then we stopped it. We killed it off. We killed it off. Yes. Okay. And uh, then we start with the LCA complete clean sheet design. Yes. Even though you had several platforms that you were manufacturing here, like the MiG-21, the MiG-27, now the Sukhoi, you still haven't been able to reverse engineer. Forget reverse engineer. You haven't been able to negotiate the transfer of the engine. Hmm. You haven't been able to negotiate all the electronics and things like hmm. that. So what Even for your LCA now, you have an Israeli uh, radar. Even though when you bought the, uh, uh, what was it? Not the Pine Gap. What was that radar called? Those big radars, anti-ballistic missile radars that we bought from the Israelis. Don't uh, remember the name. I forget the name, but mm. uh, fixed array radars. Uh, they transferred uh, gallium arsenide technology to us. Okay. What happened to that? Why couldn't you miniaturize that and make an air-to-air -air radar? Right. Uh, see, there's no accountability. It's run like a bureaucratic department. Yes. Kharite raho, kharite raho, kharite raho. There is zero pressure. If a DRDO scientist does not perform, he has job security. He'll never be sacked. That's the thing. Yeah. Right. So you've bought all these things. You've not been able to do anything. You remember the Turks, they bought that one family of submarines uh, from the Germans or the Koreans, I forget. And they've indigenized it. They bought... Uh, and part of the deal was we will get uh, fighter technology from you. And they're developing their own fifth generation fighter with the Koreans. They, mm. they got the tank technology from the Koreans and they're developing that for the Koreans. They made very, very smart decisions, economies of scale. And they decided everything is going to be based on this and iterations of this. They were accountable. They were accountable saying ki, and they had failure standards. If these these parameters aren't met, we will deem it a failure. Mm, yes. They've been fantastic at doing that. Right. This, India is what you get when you don't understand economics or you understand economics, but you're so corrupt, you try to hide your corruption under the mask of incompetence. Mm. Because in India, you can be punished for crimes of commission. You can't be punished for errors of omission. You've not criminalized errors of omission to be crimes of omission. Hmm. So we haven't been able to do that. So one good example is comparing DRDO with DARPA. They have roughly the same budget. They were both, uh, the, both the organizations started in 1958. And DRDO has roughly, I mean, DRDO is about half the budget of DARPA. But DARPA has, I don't know how many, 500 employees, or 500 people who work for, for it. And DRDO has 30,000 people, out of which 25,000 are non-scientists. Bureaucrats. So, yeah, bureaucrats. And God knows what. what. They're meant to be paper pushers. Yeah, so I don't know. So that's that's where all the money is being so wasted. It's Malik. Malik ke ghar mein, uh, uh, Indian khana pakane wala. Anglo, uh, uh, Anglo Western Khana Pakane Wala, uh, Chinese Khana Pakane Wala, hmm. uh, Jadu Pocha Karne Wali, 
ड्राइवर दो ड्राइवर सुबह के लिए एक ड्राइवर शाम के लिए एक ड्राइवर बीबी के लिए एक ड्राइवर बच्चे के लिए एक ड्राइवर कुत्ते के लिए एक ड्राइवर हाउस प्रॉपर्टी मैनेजमेंट टीम टू लुक आफ्टर योर हाउसेज एंड थिंग्स लाइक दैट एट्सट्रा 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 हाउ यू गोइंग टू एक्सैक्टली it's completely wasted yes you know your current scientific advisor uh, to the pm he has the unique distinction of never having delivered a single program okay unique distinction theek hai uh, so you know it's 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 almost like uh, um, the international symbol of indian motherhood being made a sterile barren woman who's never given child uh, okay. birth to a child right mm. but this is the tamasha that happens in india mm. Mm. what do you do uh, they will never be held accountable and this government loves bureaucrats you see so this is like some smart aleck once said this isn't a bjp government it's an ias government with outside support from the bjp <laughs> okay so you know we, we we're just not able to do that darpa hmm. is very focused yes they focus on technology see these are the they don't settle the uh, procurement plans or anything like that they don't bid for contracts hmm. they like see if you want a sick generation fighter these are all the technologies we have which we don't need to develop these are the technologies which are extremely high risk which need very very focused development they only focus on that they very frequently give out those contracts to private companies mm-hmm. uh either they create the critical mass absorbing uh you know they take sabbaticals from their companies to come work at darpa yes and they are picked and chosen from a huge scientific pool of proven private sector people who have delivered yes it is managed very very carefully and it is uh just the technology and mm. once the technology once you've achieved that technology breakthrough you know how it's done then it's given to manufacturers auctioned off to manufacturers ki by how will you miniaturize it how will you improve it etc how, how will you fit it onto this platform how will you operationalize it hmm. so darpa does technology we do bureaucracy that's right so that is why we can never be darpa because if you want to be darpa you have to take tough decisions you know when i worked at sandia national laboratories I worked outside the main compound because foreigners are yes. allowed in there. So mm-hmm. what happens there is you have uh, in New Mexico you have two laboratories, Sandia and Los Alamos. Sandia manufactures the fuses for the American nuclear bombs. Los Alamos manufactures the physics package which is the actual uh, uh, the uranium uh, and the uh, plutonium and the uh, explosive things. It is under the Department of Energy. They both get taken to uh, uh California. uh what's the lab there i forget um um the nuclear lab in california i forget now oh god anyway they get taken there the moment the fuse and the physics package are mated it is deemed to come under department of defense control mm, right mm. now i was working in the international exchange area of uh uh, uh, uh sandia and what happened out there was for that entire building if i show you that building on google maps huge building full of hundreds of people not hundreds maybe about 2 2 300 people working there there were classified floors which we were not top 5 floors were classified we were only allowed on the uh, ground and the first floor mm-hmm. the entire management for all four floors was six janitors uh four staff for all hr and uh, security clearance and everything right and uh, the canteen st- uh, two canteen staff mm-hmm. and the two canteen staff were the janitors themselves okay uh, who were kind of off shift or something but it was the same six janitors in rotation because they didn't cook or serve anything you brought lunch from home okay and what they did was they had a rotation where you know these food trucks america food mm-hmm. truck culture is a big thing yes. they had a rotation where food trucks would be called out anybody that wanted to buy food would go at 12 o'clock sharp and buy their food outside okay and um, they'd wait there for one hour and that was it uh, no drivers no chauffeurs no nothing mm. uh, you know this is how you run a lean mean smart organization exactly yeah idhar aap bolo inse aap khud apna gaadi chala lo uh, i'm sorry but the guard at the gate can't go do your wife's shopping <laughs> yaar qatal ho jayega us guard ka yeah i know chief scientist ki bibi aake she will slap him to death mm, yes so 
there is discipline out there and right. it was so easy you know here you're constantly surrounded by bad work environments they're big offices if you go into these offices sarkari offices you see they're big but they're very badly furnished and very badly maintained okay there it's just very light ikea type furniture uh, very very easy to maintain the guy can come and he va- vacuum the whole room in like 15 20 minutes and mm. that's about it you take about one week to set your system up and then it's all productivity right here you're constantly dealing with screeching people coming over with coffee and tea and saying chal re sutta marte hain chai peete hain like i think if you go to a government office about the 8 hour work shift at least 4 hours goes off in tea breaks and crap sure, like that yeah. right yes so it's 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 just not uh, the the work culture there is very different it's very different yeah, yeah. the chinese have been able to kind of copy the darpa model and they have all these programs the thousand talents program and they have uh, implemented lots of educational reforms so they have done it right but kind, we have kind of kind of, kind of. Me, there there are chinks in it and i'll hmm. tell you why the chinks are there so you know the first thing is the quality of the workforce hmm. they're much better educated than hmm. us because at 10000 dollars per capita you can afford a much better primary education hmm. in one homogenized language in one language so yes economies of scale hmm. as opposed to india which at 2000 dollars per capita and abysmal education especially a horrible primary education budget yes. uh has to do it in 20 30 different languages and you're still not teaching the kid in its natural language because the formal language is very different from the informal language yes like even in hindi hmm. uh the hindi we speak is not the kind of chaste hindi which you will hear you know there's one youtube cooking channel i follow called chef sam i forget what his name is uh uh-huh. he will only use chaste hindi which is very different from the other channels like you know with this i literally have to call up people and say ye kya bola isne aur <laughs> open up my uh, hindi diction aajkal to sab phone mein ho jata hai yeah, yeah. find out what the hell he say uh uh-huh. uh so even there you know this fallacy that english is a uh, imposition or hindi is an imposition is not true because in all regional languages including hindi which is a national language your formal language is very different from your informal language correct yes right mm. so it's it's again it's not fair on the child you've not translated enough in those languages to teach the child in terms of scientific input and uh, sociological input or human, anything realistically mm. what do you do so this is one issue that we have that china has overcome very decisively the problem in the chinese education system is that they direct research to be focused in this area the top leadership decides like it is all command economies this is what we are going to research and so you have these 15 areas that you're going to focus on this year yeah right very frequently what happens is that is not the way technology works hmm. so for example again let's go back to my mobile phone my favorite example the touch that we use on here like this is quantum physics yes. and this is something that you know uh, niels bohr tried to convince uh, uh, einstein of its value and einstein said this bullshit what are we going to use it for but today touch technology is everything i mean even in a fighter instead of doing all these sequential button pushes you just have one big touch screen and you've reduced the sensor to shoot time to just one plane dekha you click on it and you push your button and that's it yes. whereas in the old system you would have to draw your cursor or go up and line up a firing solution and then clickety click clackety clack and god knows what not uh, yes. uh, nonsense mm. you take 30 40 seconds in that a trained pilot fighting g forces while you're maneuvering that's right here it's just ta ta bus yeah that's it microsecond it's finished a trained pilot not us uh, so you know imagine that quantum physics that einstein considered so useless being such a game changer in this and the problem to bureaucratically straight jacketing science instead of science for the sake of science allow the science to grow yes uh is a very bad way of doing things mm. the second thing that they do is you know there the are two parts to technology the how and the why uh the chinese do the how through reverse engineering yes they don't understand the why mm. because why requires first principles application yes. which is why for me uh you know they've before tesla they've managed to come up with self driving cars mm. hmm? 
Now, self-driving cars work perfectly fine in an environment like China, heavily regulated with cameras and whatnot. They won't you work. You try it in Delhi. Yeah. You try it in Delhi, boss. Pandra <laughs> second me accident chodo death ho jayegi. Yeah, hmm? true. But if you look at the high technology end, look at aircraft engines. Mm. Hmm? Something as simple as that. Why does Pakistan still not want a Chinese engine for its JF-17? They still want the Russian Klimov's, uh, uh, the RD-88, I think now it is, no? the uh, big 29 ka engine for their uh, 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 JF-17s. Hmm. Today, uh, well, a uh, Chinese engine, which is all metal, they've been trying to experiment with crystal blade and things like that, lasts between 80 to 120 hours. Okay. Russia was more developed at that time, so it's now between about... Two three hundred hours you get between two three hundreds and remember these are very high performance engines yes. of usage uh, uh, before it has to be replaced. rehauled and replaced. Yeah. Guess how much an American engine lasts today? American, French, uh, British engine. I'm sure it's orders of magnitude more. Two thousand hours. Two thousand hours. Yeah. Mm. Thousand two hundred before uh, 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 A level repairs and then. Uh, 2000 hours before replacement. Okay. So, you know, I mean, where is the comparison? Mm, right. Right. Mm. The Chinese still haven't got their engine game together. Yes. Uh, Chinese submarines are still clackety clacks under the ocean. They can still be detected. They haven't got their echoing mm. uh, uh, down. Uh, there's lots of things problematic with China. They, they do fantastic finishes, but they don't do... Um, technology as well. And I think people tend to get influenced by Chinese phones thinking or the fact that it beat Tesla in a controlled Chinese city environment and extrapolate that to the complexities of war and war technology, which is not the case. Mm. So I don't think China has got it right. China has done much better than India. But then you look at it, how do you develop if you look at the Westosphere, what I call, which is basically Europe plus North America, plus the Asian allies, Japan, Korea, sure. Singapore, Australia, uh, and all those people, mm. you're looking at a population of approximately 1.1 billion mm -hmm. at an average per capita income of about $43,000. Mm -hmm. hmm? How much investment in human resources goes in there? Yes. Okay. As opposed to China, which had 1.4, uh, 1.3 or 1.4 billion people, yeah. mm -hmm. at $10,000, you're looking at 4.3 times yes. more human investment than China. Than China. This is not a market or a education that can catch up to that that quickly. Hmm. Okay, it's impossible. I mean, you know, we don't look at ways and means in this country. But when you compare those figures, China just can't catch up. Mm. And there's this horrible now, new. I, I think it's fantastic. The Chinese think it's horrible. Technology denial regime. The Chinese <laughs> students yes. are not allowed to take certain physics courses and chemistry courses yes. in uh, uh, Western universities US, yeah. and things like that, which is very good. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's that. Mm. Uh, you will... And everybody says, oh, Abhijit, you haven't read this Department of Defense report, which says the Chinese are far ahead of us. They're anti-ship ballistic missile. We don't have anything like that. Bhai, you know how the defense ministry writes their reports? They want money. You can't say, I am so ahead of China that I don't want money. Mm. No, you go tell Congress, Sir, you don't know. My house is gone. They have made me with pineapple. They have done this, they have done that. They have called the police, call the paramilitary, call the army, call the air force. They have got out of the air force. They have got out of the air force. The police have also got out of the air force. This is how you get money. Hmm. Okay? People don't get that. Hmm. Uh, they think, you know, American internal assessments of Chinese weapons are very different from the public assessments. I'm sure they are. And Congress knows that, mm. which is why they make the military work for it. Mm, right. They make the military work mm. for it. Mm. And American congressmen are extremely well informed. Right. You can't lie. Mm. Um, during the Rafale procurement, which was initially a replacement for the MiG-21, and then it got polluted somewhere along the way when they realized the Sukhoi 30 wasn't performing the way it should. And they essentially wanted the Rafale as a Sukhoi 30 
replacement without losing face for being going to choose and buying 270 of a non-performing plane or a suboptimal plane. Uh, a statement was made, as you know, I'm quoting now, as you know, every respectable Air Force has three categories of fighters, light, medium and high. Okay. Now, anybody who knows anything about a modern Air Force knows there is only low high. Hmm. Single engine low, which is used in bulk, and double engine high, which is used in uh, as the hammer. Yeah. Um, not one person in the Parliamentary Defence Committee challenged that statement. Okay. It's still on the record if you go look. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, when these porky pies are told... Uh, I'm not even sure, I mean, if, if they can get, and I can tell you, Parliamentary Defence Committee members actually take a great deal of interest and study documents. Mm. But, you know, you can't pick up everything. It will go under the radar. A lot will go under the radar. Mm. Now, look at babus who don't give a shit. Mm -hmm. Imagine how easy it is to make budus of them. Mm. And then, of course, they've got their own agendas because the Defence Production Secretary has to show orders, so he will always scuttle everything so that orders come to him. Whereas the defense secretary has to show good procurement and this and that. So he has different things. And it's just so convoluted and mismanaged. Mm -hmm. The amount of military bullshitting and bureaucratic bullshitting. Somewhere, you know, they say negatives cancel each other. Two minuses make a plus. In this case, I'm sorry. Minus plus minus make a maha minus. I see. Right. What do you think of India's maritime strategy? Should we be focusing on on aircraft carriers and concentrating our lethality in, in these giant platforms? Or should we be investing more in corvettes and missile boats and submarines especially? So I be believe in the latter strategy, but mm. this is just a preference. Mm. Okay. And it's a preference based on economics. Mm. Okay. So you have sea denial and yes. sea dominance. Yes. Sea denial you can achieve through submarines, destroyers and frigates. Ajkal frigate or destroyer may quite difference in yeah. They're classified as, you know, anywhere before it used to be 6,000 tons would be a destroyer. 3,000 tons used to be a frigate. Mm. A frigate was used for anti-submarine. A destroyer was used for anti-aircraft. Mm. A destroyer had more armor because it was meant to do aggressive roles. A frigate had had less armor because it was not it was basically meant to protect the fleet and things like that today that doesn't exist anything can be classified as a frigate all the way from 3000 right up to 7 8 i know some 7 8000 ton ships that are classified as frigates okay mm -hmm. uh, but a principal surface let's just call it a principal surface combatant and a principal subsurface combatant yes the principal surface combatant, because today you have these underwater drones and things like that, you can actually do it. I think it's a waste of resources to do it because anti-mine operations, which are very important actually, yes. and anti-submarine operations are slow. They are painful. Mm -hmm. So maybe come up with a separate platform for that, mm -hmm. for anti-mine, anti-sub. Uh, but focus on destroyers uh, and do a lot of submarines. Yeah. And this would be sea denial. And I think this is a good strategy because you can't match up to China in terms of numbers. Mm -hmm. You can't match up to China in terms of the amount of money they can throw at a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, money always works with problems. You can throw money at a problem and it will go away. Yes. Like, you know, in India, if you're a murderer, <laughs> uh, abhi idhar se hum record kar rahe, zyada dur nahi hai, Claridge's hotel, jiske bahar wo BMW hit and run hua tha. Okay. And... The kid got acquitted. No? Mm. Mm. You just throw money, you disappear witnesses and things like that. It's full on Mirzapur in Delhi. Mm. Uh, you can make problems disappear. Uh, you can make problems like this also disappear throwing money at it. Mm. Imagine the Liaoning class of aircraft carriers. Yes. Mm. They can easily afford about 10 of those with a full complement. Right. And then what are two or three of your aircraft carriers going to mm. do? Yes. If you look at the aircraft carriers... They are overkill for the small pass in the littoral. They are complete underkill for the big pass in the littoral. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, would you really send INS Vikramaditya or IAC-1? Would you risk it against Karachi? I don't think so. I don't think so. Hmm. Uh, would you risk it against, say, Saudi, the Saudi Air Force or the Qatari Air Force? Uh, I think not. Hmm. Very sophisticated planes, huge air forces. 
or the Amirati Air Force. Well, the Qatari Air Force is smaller, but it's still very sophisticated. But the Amirati Air Force is a fantastic Air Force, unlike the Saudi Air Force, which has lots of planes, but isn't all that great. Mm. Um, you definitely won't be sending it up against them. Right. You're not sending it up against two Liaonings even because they'll have a much heavier mass. So what's it being used for? Exactly right. Yeah. What, are you going to threaten Maldives with aircraft carriers? Are you going to threaten Madagascar? What are you going to get? Like you annex Madagascar for lemurs for our Delhi <laughs> uh, 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 You know, uh, 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 are you going to threaten uh, Malaysia for palm oil? Yeah, right. yeah. Are you going to threaten uh, uh, Bhutan? I mean, you can threaten Bhutan. Technically, those uh, MiG 29s have the flight range to fly over. Right. Bangladesh ko threaten karo mm. uh, yaar, ye koi What's the point of it? What's the point of this? Yeah, right. It doesn't make any sense. Mm. So, where can that money be better utilized? In having one class of submarines. Settle on that one class of submarines. How expensive are submarines? Uh, they're pretty damn expensive, but the let's let's. But they, they're much cheaper than aircraft carriers. There is a Swedish submarine. I'm not sure which it is. Gotland uh, class. Eight twenty six. A hundred dollar, a hundred million dollars per, per submarine. You can get fantastic Western submarines hmm. for very decent prices without the cost escalation we did on the Scorpion because of corruption. Hmm. Uh, even the Scorpion, boss. It's with air independent propulsion. It's a fantastic submarine. Hmm. Okay, Scorpion, tum lelo. You should have committed not to six, 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 six submarines of 100 different kinds. You should have committed to 24, 25 submarines of, of just class. one class, yeah. where you create the economies of scale in India. Now, for me, when the Australians cancelled the French submarine, it was a fantastic moment to go up to the French and say, Bhai, we Indeed. will buy 24 of your submarines. Yes. You show me at 24 what the price reduction is going to be. We don't want all the modifications the Australians have done. Hmm. Okay? Because it is much cheaper to modify your Brahmos to fit into a Western torpedo tube yeah. than it is to fit, uh, uh, change the entire submarine and fit uh, vertical launch systems and this and that or ex even there, you know, putting in a larger torpedo tube is relatively cheap. Mm, right. But not VLS systems, mm. right? You tell them for 24, how much do you want? And the French, you know, they're very willing to sell you those nuclear submarines. Mm. Their only thing is, give us four or five years to negotiate with the Americans. Uh, the Americans won't sell you those submarines. We'll sell them to you. And remember, France has already said the um, IAE exclusion for India applies to everything, including reprocessing technology. And the French nuclear submarine is the only one where you don't have to cut the submarine open every 15, 20 years when the fuel is done and then refuel it and then solder the entire submarine. So it's a modular area. thing, isn't it? It's, a, it's entirely, it's a plug and play. Mm. Upper, there is a uh, dhakan mm. and you open the dhakan, put, put it in, up. yeah. Mm, right. Mm. So it's a fantastic option for us, uh, which you then use, uh, you buy French reprocessing technology. We should have technically mated our nuclear program with the French nuclear program, bought 49, 50 or 51% of Areva mm. and said, this is going to be a joint program, civil reactors. Abhi tak hamara reactor. I want all our viewers to go back and read how often has the AAC said, AEC, Atomic Energy Commission said, the indigenous reactor is going to be commissioned next year. For the last 12, 15, I came back to India in 2011. Mm -hmm. Every year I see two articles saying it is going to be commissioned next month. It is going to be commissioned next year. Bara saal ho beet gaye, dekhe abhi tak commission nahi hua hai. Okay. It is still experimental, experimental. It's like, you know, that song from Annie, tomorrow, tomorrow, it's always a day away. Amesha, yeah. chalte. lack of accountability that we're talking about. You should have meted it. Uh, you should have bought 24. Or if the economics didn't work out, you buy 24 of the scorpions. Buy one submarine for crying. One class of submarine. Just one yeah. class. Yeah. Make a lot of it so that you yeah. learn it. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when we bought the HDW, Rajiv Gandhi actually negotiated that deal very, very well. Okay. That HDW type 1500 submarine. You know, the kind of technology we saw coming in, the blind soldering, like your soldering from the outside and the machine doing laser uh, welding on the inside. We actually got a lot of technology in that because we incorporated those IKL rescue spheres, which was very complex technology. The problem was... We didn't follow through with building more of those submarines. So all the skills that we gained were lost. Were lost. That's what keeps happening. Exactly. It yeah. keeps happening. So it's, 
I prefer the sea denial strategy because at that point, have a one training aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. Okay, because these are skills that need to keep getting honed. Agree, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. Vikramaditya hai. Now just keep using that over and over again. Just keep experimenting with new planes. Use it as a training platform. Keep it as a training. Remember, China got the uh, Varyag. Uh, uh, which is now the, was it the Liaoning or the Shanghai? Liaoning, yeah, the, yeah, Liaoning. I, the floating yeah, casino. Yeah, but they experimented on that for 15, 20 years before they decide to take the plunge and make That's right. uh, an aircraft carrier. Mm. Uh, you need to keep those skills updated. Yes. So keep that in a training capacity. Train your marine pilot core, but build up a solid sea defense because once that is done, Adding that layer of sea dominance is much easier. Yes, you need to You're first be defensive. In, exactly. Yeah, first, uh, first secure your defenses yeah. and denial. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's something that I don't see happening. They're still asking for a third aircraft carrier, perhaps. That's going to be really overkill. So, teen se bhi, are you going to be able to attack Karachi? No, you will have to hide them when there's a war. Exactly. Yeah. You remember what happened in 1971? They right? had to hide it in Vishakhapatnam uh, or something. Yeah, they had to hide it in Vishakhapatnam. Yes. Uh, they went on saying, oh, no, no, we were actually, you know, we were gearing it up to fight the Americans. Huh. Kisko jhoot bol raha hai, boss. Mm, mm. I know several people who fought that war. You tell me, boss, we, we did not want to take on the Americans. Mm. Okay. So... In, but look, our boys are very brave. You tell them, boss, you're going to die, but you go put up the last They'll, do it. They'll do it. They'll do it, yes. They'll do it. Yeah. But you don't, we're not like Pakistan to waste lives on stupid waste shit. Waste precious lives, yeah. Exactly. We waste lots of lives by incompetence. That's mm, a different That's matter, a different thing. Yeah. Uh, not deliberately, not, mm. not on foolish uh, 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 things. Mm. So, I, this is my personal feeling based on economics mm. that I don't think we're following the right path. We're not. I agree. And this new submarine thing mm. where they want VLS. Why? They want the submarine modified so that they can put VLS Brahmos. Bhai, to Brahmos ka size kam kar de na. It's, it's much a much easier cheaper program. That. It's much easier. You can get the submarines right now. Everybody, you remember that uh, infantry combat vehicle program? They issued RFP after RFP after RFP. Everybody keeps pulling out of those RFPs. Mm. Why? Because they say, bhai, there ko infantry fighting vehicle chahiye ya main battle tank chahiye and basically the only requirement you don't require it seems is that it can uh, 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 swim in the water at 40 knots like a speed boat mm. and fly in the air like a helicopter right right everything else everything else mm. they basically decided like you know if you're given a choice uh, kisi bhi aaj ke film actress se shaadi kar lo mm. uh, 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 aaj ke film actress kaun hai they all look the same um <laughs> Aaj ki film actresses kaun hai? Kareena Kapoor. Haan, thik hai. Kareena Kapoor. Then? Uh, Deepika Padukone. Haan, Deepika Padukone. Then? Somebody else, one th third person. I don't know. Where. Yeah. Okay, let's call them actress A, B, C, D, E. Okay, thik five. Yeah. Ye paanch actresses hai. Mere ko na in paancho me se koi ni chahiye. Aap na A ka nose lijiye. Us pe ye B ka aankh daliye. Aur us pe wo C ka baal daliye. और जो इसके गोरे गोरे गाल हैं डी के उस पे डाल दीजिए और जो सिलेंडर नेफ्रिटिटी की तरह गला है ई e का वो डाल दीजिए mm, right. अब ये सब मानेंगे कि उनका नोज कट हो जाए उनका आंख निकाल दिया जाए उनके गाल जाके कोई फ्रैंकेनस्टाइन मॉन्स्टर की तरह कोई फ्रैंकेनस्टाइन मॉन्स्टर बनाओ सो हु कम्स अप विद दिस रिक्वायरमेंट्स इज इट द आर्मी इज इट द ब्यूरोक्रेट्स इट्स द मिलिट्री द मिलिट्री द मिलिट्री कम्स अप विद दिस बुलशिट ओके the manufacturers just don't want it because see that product is an everything is connected to everything else working as one organic body. Yes. <coughs> it's it's not going to work. I mean, you take again to use my, uh, this is such a useful thing. You tell me hmm. what phone do you have? I have a Samsung somewhere. Uh aapka phone DJ ek second. Now are bhai ye bhi Apple hai. Par <laughs> chalo. मेरा थोड़ा छोटा है ना नहीं हाँ वही है आपका केस थोड़ा बड़ा है हाँ ठीक है थैंक यू ठीक है नाउ दिस इज अ नाउ इफ आई से भाई इसका मेरे को स्क्रीन अच्छा नहीं लगा मैं इसमें से स्क्रीन निकाल के इस पे डालूंगा टेल मी इज इट इवन वर्थ द टाइम एंड द एफर्ट टोटल वेस्ट ऑफ टाइम एंड्रॉइड वोट अग्री टू इट एपल वोट अग्री टू इट यस इफ यू डिसाइड दैट इज वॉट यू वॉन्ट टू डू इन ऑल लाइकलीहुड 
if uh, you went and told your parents that they'd try to find you a rehabilitation home for drugs Correct. or yeah. a lunatic asylum to check you into mm. because the dukan wala is not invested in you he'll say chal put yahan se yeah okay this is what they want to do they don't get it they like they, they make this best of everything list banate hain aur list ko combine karke ye hamara requirement hai okay see there's a very simple way to overcome it which no bureaucrat wants well the bureaucrats aren't educated enough as we've seen with the tcs that's been employed today 20% uh, yeah right uh, tcs on foreign uh, these things by your bureaucrats don't understand economics do you think they're going to understand technology uh so they don't know how to frame this uh politicians the less said the better but one simple way is effects based you s- g- tell each manufacturer by dick these are the formations we expect you come up with a plan to take it out and you tell me how much of your product i need how i need it uh what your intelligence assessments of this are what its strengths and swot analysis and what is your plan to overcome them mm. that makes sense yeah it it makes a lot of sense each manufacturer will tell you and you then buy from that manufacturer and mass produce yes ye nahi hmm i will take the gun from here the uh, turret from here the uh, uh, tracks from here the exhaust from here the engine from there uh, chal right how do you see the how do you see the india russia relationship is russia a trustworthy partner i mean they have been doing this drushba exercises with pakistan mm. they have been supplying stuff to pakistan they stopped after 21 but how do you see this relationship going long term india russia so you know for a very very long time the embassy in delhi mm. has been saying boss let's focus on ric mm. and this is what i've been hearing in kremlin as well mm. and they had a very clear thing see because even though they will bullshit in public in private russian diplomats are very uh focused on what they want um uh, and their thing was boss we may have been the superpower but we're not the superpower anymore we can't contain china mm. so let's band the wagon mm. individually we won't be able to resist china but if both of us pretend to be china's friends and china's allies mm. uh together mm. india plus uh, uh, uh russia can kind of keep china at least we can direct china elsewhere and not focus china towards us that's a good ploy it's a good ploy it's a yes. fantastic ploy india's foreign policy goal has been theoretically very clear since nehru's time it's a disaster in execution okay because it's not even sunk down to everybody within the ifs itself which is that india being a land centric power we will not tolerate any grouping or coalition or alliance too big in asia basically that translates to china and russia cannot be allowed to come together ever but are we in no, a position to stop that no happening? matter what the cost uh and usually it involves um uh, an anatomical position called as fellatio okay hmm um kids don't google that adults can google that uh we will play off one against the other mm, okay okay nehru actually in the early part till uh, uh krishna menon got involved in this mm. and destroyed a lot of shit uh did it very very well mm. you know he created the bandung conference because his whole thing was he'd go to mao setung and say are mao you are such a great revolutionary leader sir look at that bloody ukrainian country bumpkin khrushchev mm. he is not even worthy of being the dirt under your shoes mm. wo to aapke pair ki juti hai juti yeah i you are a great asian power sir i am going to create this conference which will showcase you as the leader of asia mm. then he'd go to khrushchev and say sir see china you should treat them like a little brother you know you are the great world power sir we will give you whatever you want sir mm. uh, hindi rusi bye bye sir mm-hmm. he did it decently okay the problem seems to be you know at some level is hatred of america also clouded his judgment mm. uh, american capitalism mm-hmm. uh, this whole 
anti colonial posturing his own bad economics and the need to go beg from them mm-hmm. all the time uh, from the west uh, and from russia mm-hmm. uh, and a lot of damage was done by krishna menon honestly right. just pissing off people when you didn't need to piss off people mm-hmm. you know so when the hungarian invasion happened when the uh, 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 crushing of the budapest uh, thing happened uh, he was given instructions by nehru to vote against the ussr at the un okay he disobeyed that and he voted for the ussr without consequences well well mm-hmm. without consequences okay and nehru never brought accountability to his paltu kutte mm-hmm. mm so this became a problem mm-hmm. again what you're seeing is you have a lot of foreign ministers who love their own voices mm-hmm. uh true it's not like krishna menon where it's acerbic but where is the action on the ground you mm. have a pathetically small foreign service yes true and your foreign service is your primary source of intelligence collection you need a foreign service about 3 4000 people at least at least at least yes we have a smaller foreign service than singapore correct and it's become smaller okay yeah it's become smaller i see the primary diplomats are now down to 600 and something it used to be 720 now we're down to 600 and something oh, wow okay yeah. hmm. uh and even those diplomats uh spend their time they think of a foreign posting largely as some kind of uh, uh reward okay uh kaam karna ye karna like you know when i was at the iea uh this was when you know uh, it became very clear to everybody in europe but nobody in india i was reading newspaper reports in india at that time when the uh, nsg membership was uh, the failed nsg membership yes i landed up i was in warsaw for a summit uh nato summit chal raha tha so i was on the there on the sidelines of that hmm. and on the way i just decided to stop in vienna because i love vienna on my on route to rome hmm. and i got taken around because a former student of mine was uh, working at the iea and i heard all the stuff which i was like how have i not heard this in delhi uh we were not going to get nsg membership hmm and the folks who were opposing it told us very very clearly why we were not getting nsg membership none of which was conveyed out here uh and it was in china it was people like austria ireland and mexico mm right uh because their thing was when we gave you the nuclear deal you promised us there would be a full bifurcation of your reactors there would be military reactors and there would be civilian reactors okay you still have not bifurcated mm mm-hmm. how the hell are we going to get give you next when you haven't delivered on your first promise okay and they went willing to trust china because what china told them was see in uh, uh, the india exemption the 2008 ie exemption they said uh, you know tum aage lado hum tumhare piche hain you know aap aap aage badho hum tumhare saath hain or whatever yes. you know, that slogan and the moment those three came because america did aggressive like you know i met uh, uh the then austrian foreign minister for 2008 her name is uh, ursula plasnik i think mm-hmm. i was having breakfast with her and she gave me something really interesting apparently condoleezza rice she was trying to avoid condoleezza rice because she intended to vote against india okay two secret service guys came and literally cornered her to the wall mm-hmm. they did not lay a hand on her but they fenced her, effectively imprisoned her mm-hmm. called condi rice Condi Rice came and read her the Riot Act. I see. You will vote for India, okay? And at that point, once the conversation has been had, you can't do anything about it. Mm-hmm. So America strong-armed Ireland, Mexico, and Austria to vote for India for that IE exemption. exemption. Mm-hmm. That was the one, two, three deal. It yes. all happened simultaneously at the same time. Here, the Americans weren't willing to do that because even the contracts for American reactors, which were meant to go through, never went through. They still yes. haven't gone through. Yes. and what ended up happening was that this time the austrians uh, 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 uh irish and this one decided bhai jab hum gir gaye tum china kahan the hmm you did not pick up the flag after we dropped it or pick up the baton after we dropped it so this time you will be in front we will be rear guard hmm and you can't do this with china what uh, Condi Rice, and this time anyway, the Americans under Obama weren't willing to do what Condi Rice was and George Bush were willing to do for India. Mm-hmm. So uh, you know, I found that fascinating because you don't think that kind of thuggery will be used at that level. Uh-huh. And she's a fantastic lady. Like she's got this reputation of being anti-India in India. She's not. She's like she had 
very very valid concerns okay and her concerns had more to do with pakistan mm. because her thing was once we let you in uh, do i trust you yes do i trust pakistan no mm. if i let you in how do i prevent uh, 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 china from letting pakistan in right uh, the solution to that was found and then she was like boss you haven't delivered on your promises how do i let you go through i have to make it so expensive for you that india is able to absorb the cost but pakistan is not able to absorb that cost right uh, which is very smart i mean she's not being anti india hmm. uh, she is imposing the maximum pain on you so that you will not die but she wants that pain for pakistan to be so great that pakistan will die hmm. she's asking you for help yes. in keeping pakistan out i mean it's not an unreasonable request now when you promise people contracts and don't give them contracts and you refuse to understand what the austrians the irish and the mexicans and others are saying and swiss also apparently uh, that evening the swiss president was in india uh gave a statement which the indian press are so trashy they knew was the statement was because the indian press can't afford in foreign trips uh, they can't afford foreign trips so they live off handouts from the mea mm. they reported the mea's version of the statement which was complete fabrication and misrepresentation and the swiss were furious it, no it wasn't the swiss who had come it was the president who had gone to switzerland the president or the somebody had gone to switzerland and the uh, thing was issued out there the briefing was given and the mea completely gave a wrong statement they were furious about it mm -hmm. there were a lot of people who were furious about that and you know you piss off people you actively piss off people by mis misrepresenting what they've said mm -hmm. you misrepresent what the austrians say and pretend that they're nazis and what not out here people aren't inclined to do you favors when you screw them over like that True. You know? there, there is a element of honor involved in yes it. uh the chutia was manipulating that is still in the foreign service right okay there are no consequences for him mm. uh, even though he screwed us over very very badly on the nsg thing no consequences for him uh so uh what do you do so this is how things work out mm. or don't work out in this case so what's been the deal with the the nuclear deal we have with the us a 1 to 3 deal did anything come out of it I mean we haven't given any any contracts to Westinghouse or whatever. No. Uh uh I mean I believe we should have given them at least mercy contracts, mm. four or five contracts each. Mm -hmm. Um did we, we did we benefit did we gain anything from this? From the Americans no because they have a very strict interpretation of reprocessing technology. Mm. So it would have been reprocessing would have to be done back in America, mm -hmm. but they would agree to fuel supply and ultimately the more trust grows, the more they'll do wink wink nudge nudge and it for the americans it's all about trust hmm. you build up trust with us the more and more and more we get to trust you the more and more and more technology we sell you okay india views that as a relationship between a cocaine addict and the cocaine supplier hmm. it's not wrong but i think it is kind of misguided the hmm. french on the other hand are extremely reliable uh, they were offering you everything why didn't you go there right I mean you've just shot yourself in the foot what was that all for mm -hmm. all the diplomatic capital we built up lost as a country that overpromises and never delivers mm -hmm. and then ask for the next thing after not delivering on your promises see india's diplomatic reputation and this is one of the reasons that putin also went kind of cold on india is because every time apparently he met manmohan singh he was promised a lot of things which never got delivered okay Now the problem with Putin was uh because the caliber of Soviet diplomats is not the same as the caliber of Russian diplomats it's gone down considerably. Okay. He thought he was being lied to. He thought he was being taken for a ride. Mm. Whereas in India anybody knows that there is no ill intent in any of this. Mm. Uh tumko dikhana hai even if you are bankrupt you will bankrupt yourself on your daughter's wedding but nobody should know you're a bhikari kangal. Right. Mm. Mm. So you know Indian government would go there and say 
Putin, you only want, uh, why 100 aircraft, we will buy 100,000 aircraft from you, uh, you know, and put gold inside it, all the buttons should be diamond buttons and uh, ruby, <laughs> uh, uh, why glass cockpit, we should have ruby cockpits, mm. and you know, uh, uh, the exhaust on the bum should be platinum, and then, you know, when the contract is signed, 20, <laughs> lowest specification. Mm. Right. It, it, but this is how things happen in India. I mean, we all know that this is the Indian way of doing things. Yes. We are the and then Fuddu. So, anyway, now because of circumstances, he started reorienting towards India. But again, this was uh, China's thing. Because you were, we were talking about RIC in this yes. context. Yes. China's thing was very clear. They don't believe in allies, even temporary allies. They believe in instability all around. Hmm. And what they do is they find these free radicals. Hmm. Basically, high risk accepting states, what the West would call rogue states, right. to destabilize every target. Hmm. So when they see India, they've got a Pakistan. Pakistan. When they see Japan and Korea, they've got a North Korea. Yes. When they see Europe, they now have a Russia. Hmm. They love doing this. Hmm. Because then you get bogged down in tactical, 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 and you can't think strategically Strategic. anymore. Mm. Uh, because, you know, when you have cancer and when you have hemorrhoids at the same time, uh, <laughs> you will focus on the hemorrhoids. You'll mm. be like, Kal chemotherapy jana hai. let me focus today on uh, my ointment or whatever medication for the hemorrhoids that I have. Um, so, you know, it's, it's one of those things where they trap you in it. Now, three, two cultures that are kind of compatible. I mean, the Russian view isn't so different from the Indian view. Hmm. The problem is the Russians underestimate the depth of problems between India and China. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. They see good intentions in China when we know the Chinese don't have good intentions. Hmm. So India and Russia are fundamentally compatible. Hmm. But Russia is very naive about China. Really? Naive? Naive. Naive. Okay. Mm -hmm. I use that word advisedly, naive about China, mm -hmm. because if we can solve our boundary disputes with China, Indeed, why not sort of you? Mm -hmm. But boss, you're a spent force. Mm -hmm. You may have a huge nuclear thing, but you're not a demographic threat to them. Mm -hmm. You're not really an economic threat to them anymore. Mm -hmm. Why do they not sort out their problems with Korea and Japan uh, and India? Well, they're happy to sort it out with you. Yes. Uh, they don't think in those terms. And increasingly, what we've begun to see is they're very smart at manipulating the Russians. So at all the trilateral forums, especially in BRICS, we saw this. Mm. BRICS, mein kya hota tha? the Russian position would be different. The Chinese position would be different. By the end of the BRICS academic summit, two, three days later, the Russian position would be indistinguishable from the Chinese position. It would be the Chinese position. You know okay. why? Because the Chinese would not say, hey, Saleh janta hai. I am China, you are Russia. I am number one, you are number two. No. Mm. It's easy. We are new. We're big, but we're new. You have years of experience in this. And see, you are the great European power. You know, you're the land of Lenin. You're the land of Stalin. Why don't you show us how it's done? And that flattery, giving, you know, this humiliation of Russia that the West did. The psychological impact, we never gauge it. China has never humiliated Russia that way. True. It could have. Mm -hmm. It chose not to. Mm. Because it played it very, 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 very carefully. And so they massage the Russian ego and see to it. Their way of dealing with Pakistan is very different from their way of dealing with Russia. Mm. Uh, they don't deal, dare deal with Burma, even though Burma is nowhere near as strong as Pakistan. They don't dare deal with Burma the way they treat Pakistani generals. Mm. Pakistani generals will be called in for a dressing down. Burmese generals are treated as equals okay. because Burma has historically known exactly how to deal with China. Mm. They'll go very close to China. The next day, they'll kick out all the Chinese and shut down all their projects. Mm. So, you know, the small dogs bite the most. <laughs> you know that? Yes. You're more likely to get bitten by a Pomeranian or a Chihuahua <laughs> than you are by a Rottweiler or a Doberman. Mm. 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 Uh, the thing is, the Rottweiler and the Doberman will cause massive damage. Yes. The Chihuahua won't cause damage, but heck, you'll it'll hurt. Mm. <laughs> okay. Burma is the Chihuahua. Okay. So, China is an experienced dog trainer who knows exactly how to treat Burma. Right. 
दे नो दैट पाकिस्तान इज द सॉर्ट ऑफ स्केर्ड ओबीडियंट रॉट वाइलर एज अपोज टू द पॉमरेन एन ची वावा हु नेवर लिसन टू एनी बडी एंड दे नो रशिया इज द सॉर्ट ऑफ अब्यूज रॉट वाइलर विच कैन बी very temperamental and unpredictable okay so they deal with each country very differently but that end goal is always the same now hmm. how do the three of us come together hmm. how do we build a bridge with russia hmm. see as long as they have these very naive views of china as long as they fall for this chinese massaging and remember the chinese market is an infinitely bigger market than the indian market for the That's russians right. the russians are practically in a chinese monopsony hmm. thankfully because of ukraine we've kind of broken that cocaine Uh, dealer addict dependency hmm. by buying lots of russian oil yes the thing is we don't have an industrial base to be able to consume their other commodities hmm. molybdenum or new age uh, uh, you know minerals uh, russian industrial diamonds uh, etc etc we, we we don't have that hmm. so how do we deal with how do we and you know you can't buy enough of russian things unless you have an industrial uh, capacity to match china Right. China is always going to be a much bigger market. Mm-hmm. We try, and the Russians also understand what is happening, and so they're trying very hard to maintain that relationship mm-hmm. with India. And to be fair to us, you know, we went on telling the Americans, "You're pushing the Russians too hard. Right, yes. You're pushing them too hard. Stop mm-hmm. this bullshit now. Mm-hmm. NATO is not. You decide what is more important. Your stupid NATO expansion is to India and China." Yes, right. Uh, because China is a big strategic threat. Russia is a tactical threat, if at all that. If at all. And they'd be like, no, 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 no. You know, and and you know, I've been part of Track Two, Track One Point Five delegations that told the Americans this, and they keep saying, no, Abby, the Russians will never align with the Chinese, never align with the Chinese, never align with the Chinese. Hmm. Then, they go, what happened? Did the Americans miss a trick when they failed to totally dismantle Russia in the nineties? Ah, uh, yeah. I mm. think they did, mm. uh, because see, Russia is one of those countries which you can never keep down. Mm. It just always rises and becomes bigger, at, and its collapse is always catastrophic. <laughs> But every time it collapses, mm. it comes back bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm. You look at all the principalities of Novgorod and things like that. Yes. The Mongols just came and massacred them. Yes, totally. there was no Russia left at the end of Kiev and Rus. Yes, right. and they rose and became very very powerful yes. i mean they became the biggest country in europe under that first uh, uh, the under the rurikid dynasty right uh ivan the terrible being ivan the, the last terrible. of the uh, rurikids hmm. uh even though the rurikids ru- ruled as princes of moscow uh, even before the mongol uh, this thing yes and then you have uh, you know because ivan the terrible kills his son yes. and you have the time of troubles hmm. where the poles come and sack moscow yes everything is destroyed and that is you know that famous uh, 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 opera by uh, 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 mussorgsky uh, uh, boris uh, godunov mm. uh, uh, no is that tchaikovsky boris godunov is tchaikovsky isn't it yeah and the life for the tsar is also written at that by ivan suzanin uh, by glinka is in that set in that period of the time of troubles where this young romanov kid is found he is made the tsar and within 50 to 100 years boss their back like never before hmm. and then in the course of a few hundred years they go and occupy poland yes and then it collapses spectacularly when napoleon. the Tsar, when the romanovs fall hmm. uh, they don't collapse under napoleon they yeah, crush this, napoleon napoleon ultimately. sacked moscow did. he did uh, he did yeah. he burnt down moscow hmm. but he didn't win the war he didn't win the war uh unlike say the romanovs when the romanov collapse happened yes it was a complete disintegration parts of The, uh, Russia just broke away. True. Uh, Ukraine broke away. Mm. Belarus, bro- uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia broke away. Finland broke away. Everything broke away. Mm. Catastrophic collapse. Yes. And they come back as the USSR, even bigger even than Latvia. the Romanov Empire. That's right. Right. Mm. You can't keep Russia down. Mm. Russia's recovery, I think, will take much longer now because they're in a demo- uh, in a demographic dead decline. End. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But I think Ukraine will be Russia's last hurrah. Well. Uh, I won't say last hurrah, but I'll say uh, last hurrah for a while. For a while. Do you think the future of Russia is Islamic? No, no, absolutely not. I think uh, uh, they're very, very clear about their European Christian identity. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they have to get over this inferiority complex that they have because the Europeans don't treat them as Europeans. True. Yeah. They see them as half Mongol. I mean, if you looked at Boris Yeltsin. Yeah. 
I mean, even Putin. He definitely had Mongol blood. Even in Putin. Yeah. yeah. But remember, the Romanovs have Mongol blood in them. Hmm. You know, through I think it was uh, Empress Anna or somebody, where uh, one of the Tatar families got married in, hmm. and and you know the latest uh, dissident to be sentenced to life in prison. Uh, what's his name? Alexei uh, Karamurza. Okay. Kara is black in Turkish. Kara. Mirza is prince in yes. Farsi. Black prince. Black prince. Mm. Uh, a, a, a Turkic family that got Christianized and whatever. Mm. There is massive miscagenation in Russia. They say if, if you scratch a Russian, you'll find a Tatar inside. Basically. Yeah. Basically. I mean, they love their racial purity. But <laughs> no, they're not. Um, so it's Viking meets Tatar meets Mongol meets uh, Kalmuk or what have you. Lenin. I mean, you look at the USSR. Mm. Which of the leaders of the USSR was a Russian? Lenin wasn't. Lenin wasn't. He was a Chuvash. Mm. Yeah. Uh, which is a micro minority, I guess. Mm. Uh, si si Siberian uh, Eskimo minority. Inuit or Inuitish yes. uh, minority. Mm. The first Eskimo leader <laughs> of the world, I guess. Yes. Uh, so he was Chuvash. Stalin was Georgian. Khrushchev Georgian. was Ukrainian. Uh, Brezhnev was Russian. So mm. he would Brezhnev. have been. Yeah. Gorbachev was Georgian, wasn't he? Uh, no, Gorbachev was also Russian. Russian. Mm. Okay. Andropov was also Russian. Mm. So, um, uh, and Brezhnev was the first Russian to rule Russia in two, three hundred years. Because <laughs> remember, the house of Romanov, the cadet branch, mm. uh, what we call the Romanovs are actually the house of Gotrop. Uh, and they were the cadet branch of the Romanov family, which by the time of Tsar Nicholas II was in entirely German because they went on marrying German princes True, after yes. German princes after mm. German, German princes. Peter the Great himself married a Latvian uh, who became uh, Zarina uh, Elisaveta. Mm. And then there was the second Elisaveta. And then there was Catherine who was German. Catherine who was German, yeah. uh, And we don't even know if her son was actually the uh, <laughs> son of her yeah. uh, husband. Mm. And he had a huge complex because of that, of course. And then his son who killed him, Alexander, had huge complexes for killing his father. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, so Napoleon's invasion kind of... Uh, Turned him into a saint because he comes out on the balcony in St. Petersburg and swears that famous oath on he will liberate every uh, uh, ounce of Holy Mother Russia kind of uh, this thing. Mm. But uh, it's such a miscagenated society. Yes. It's, uh, the Russians haven't had a Russian ruler in a very long time. Mm. So the Europeans look down on them. Yes. You even look at the language being used now. They, they're incompatible with our values. It's such a dehumanizing language. They're animals. Yes. They're Tatars. Mm. They're Mongols. Uh, they're barbarian. I mean, you see it on Twitter. You see, you openly, see yeah. government handles yes. of Eastern European countries tweeting that kind of bullshit. Yes. You've seen the kind of racist shit we have seen from the official handle of Ukraine yes. about uh, uh, the Russians. So, uh, you know, they have that. But they're too white to be Asian as well. True. <laughs> so, and they're too Christian to be Asian. Yes. So we can't see them as one of us. Yeah, we can't. I think we have to play on the inferiority complex and say, they go, Udhar reject ho gaye, come join us. But then, you know, as Groucho Marx used to say, I don't want to be the member of a club that wants me as a member. <laughs> so if we start looking down on the Russians, maybe they'll want to become part of our club. But for that, we need to have much higher living standards. Mm, right. Right, that's about Russia. How do you see the diplomacy, the foreign policy that India employs today? The Modi Jai Shankar foreign policy? What are your views on that? A lot of externalities. Mm. Very little to do with us. Mm. But let me tell you what were the good things that happened before Jai Shankar. Mm. You know, we had a huge backlog of unfulfilled state visits. Now, out of the 160 odd UN members, 40 countries comprise the OECD. 40, uh, 40 odd. The Organization of Economically Developed, I mean, I'm calling it the organization, but it, they're all the first world countries. Mm. Okay. And for them, state visits aren't that important hmm. because, you know, they're more focused on outcomes. They're first world countries. They're focused on outcomes. They're not focused on tamasha and drama. Hmm. But for the remaining 120 countries, which are governance deficit states, state visits, many apna vice president beja, tumne apna deputy deputy vice president beja, tumhare pe lanat hai. Yeah. Attitude. Hmm. The clearest example of this was when Mursi came to India, President hmm. Mohammad Mursi of Egypt. Hmm. He came to India, Muslim country, coming to India on a standalone visit, not visiting Pakistan. Right. They expected when, uh, after Mursi had been removed and the new uh, 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 canal, what was the canal? Uh, the uh, Suez Canal, the new branch of it was being opened. 
they expected a similar standalone visit. Uh, we sent the vice president to the opening of the canal. Hmm. And this was very, very important for... Uh, who's the current guy? Sisi. Sisi. Abdullah Fatah al Sisi. Um, it was very important for Sisi because, remember, he was under sanctions at that time because he had taken over. Hmm. He needed this as validation. Yes. And you sent bloody Venkaya Naidu. Hmm. Like, who are you kidding? Hmm. They sent a full-serving president on a standalone you send Venkaya and I do as part of a multi-country trip. Mm. But that got rectified. We then fixed it with high-level visits. So if you remember, Modi now travels a lot less than he used to in he his does. first term. Because yes. there was a whole backlog mm. of activity. So a lot of State Department foreign ministry stuff across the world is activity masquerading as achievement. Okay. Mm. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, foreign ministries are like the humanities. Mm -hmm. You can go bullshit, you know, you can say, uh, uh, for example, uh, a foreign ministry discussion is like, are you Abhijit Chabra? Mm. But what is the Abhijit Chabra? Mm -hmm. Is it the clothes that you are wearing? Is it the skin on you? Mm. Is it your brain? Mm. Is it your soul? Mm. Is it your heart? Is it the, your humanity that makes you Abhijit Chabra or is it your intelligence that makes you Abhijit Chabra? What I've said right now is total bloody bullshit nonsense. Yeah. This is what foreign policy, most 99% of foreign policy is. Right. Okay. Mm. It's massaging your ego mm. or humiliating you when required mm. and collecting intelligence. Defense, you can't do that. Defense is mathematics. Yes. Unless you're going to woke, woke mathematics, which is 2 <laughs> plus 2 equals 7. Yes. Right. Uh, in defense, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Mm. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Chaiye to lele nahi to phir put yaan se. Yeah. That's the attitude. So, and this is why, you know, there's a fantastic paper. Defense is from uh, Mars and State is from Venus. Read it. It was written by a Marine Corps officer. It's a fascinating paper. Everybody should read it. I see. So anyway, all the, achieve, all the visits were completed in the first term of Modi. Mm -hmm. By this time, certain other things had aligned to support us. So, mm -hmm. for example, Mohammed bin Zayed, who had been grooming Mohammed bin Salman. Mm -hmm. Mohammed bin Salman gets control sheer alignment of nature that King Sal that Salman becomes king before he dies mm. and he, he removes everybody in the line of succession and brings the next it, it will no longer be a son of Ibn Saud it will be the son of Salman who becomes uh, the next king, uh, the next king yeah. uh, which is uh, Muhammad bin Salman etc uh, etc et what did we have to do with it he then initiates this whole thing Trump comes and he you know he breaks out of this toxic think tank circle of bullshit talking, uh, where he's very practical. Everybody told him the Arabs won't make a deal. He's made a bath to Karnido. Me Arab says, Sunna Chata, tu con hota, Mirko Batanevala, Mirko Naito Brookings, Chay, Naito Carnegie, Chay, Naito Yichi, Naito Wochi, me Jake, Salman says, Sunna Chata. Yeah. Two bowl Mirko. They find they can do a deal. Hmm. They do a deal. And one of the reasons the entire think tank circle, Brookings became the epicenter of all the bullshit that was being spread about Trump. Hmm. The Russia files were literally yeah. concocted at Brookings. Hmm. He then, and that's because they felt humiliated. The think tank circle felt humiliated hmm. that this guy is not listening to us and getting so much done. So they'll constantly underplay every one of Trump's achievements. Right. It wasn't such a big thing, you know. It, it was Mohammed bin Zayed. It was actually Mohammed bin Salman. Trump was zero. No, it required all three. Hmm. It required the mentorship of Mohammed bin Zayed. It required that open mind of Mohammed bin Salman. It required the sort of uh, decapitation, uh, succession decapitation hmm. that King Salman did. Yes. And it required Trump to underwrite that deal for that normalization in the Middle East to happen. Right. And it required Trump to alienate uh, Iran hmm. in order to sub... We are fighting too much amongst each other. So we make that pillar the enemy and then we can all unite. Right. It required all of that to happen. Now, what is our contribution, boss? We just continued policy as it was. Mm. The real changes in Indian policy will come when you expand the foreign service and yes, improve right. the career training. Mm. Right now, through career training is non-existent. Mm. Uh, you know, the accountability, uh, deliverables and tangibles is non-existent. Mm. Uh, you know, I know ambassadors abroad who have called eminent journalist friends of mine for... Uh, lunch at McDonald's. Okay. You are an ambassador. You are an ambassador. You are a senior journalist or think tanker or a vice president of a firm. 
you're asking them out to lunch at McDonald's. McDonald's. Like, really? <laughs> what does that say about you? Come say, come. You know, there's a charm in inviting somebody home and cooking for them, which they go gaga over. Yeah, too. You can have a very humble home, mm. but the very act of calling them home, because you know, Europeans are very impersonal. They won't call you home unless they feel really close to you. Yes. It's at a restaurant. You call them home and charm them with something even simple. They really love it. Yes. I'm yet to meet a European who doesn't like dal chawal. They go gaga over dal chawal. Mm. Who doesn't? I mean, apparently it's uh, it's it's known to be... Um, An aphrodisiac? It, it has, no. It has two compounds. The rice mm. and the dal have two compounds, mm. which are perfectly complementary, which make it addictive. Okay. Mm. Mm. So, um, it's one of those things. Uh, do it. Mm. But they're not taught social graces. See, at one point of time, the syllabus was made for Maharaja's sons joining the IFS, which I they see. used to. Okay. So you didn't need to teach them English. You didn't teach them uh, how to hold your fork. You didn't need to teach them when to play up your Indianness and eat with your hands and charm them. Hmm. And for them not to think of you as a barbarian. Hmm. Uh, you know, I know several stories of princes in the foreign service. Well, not princes, but, you know, Kumar Saabs and all of that who would literally go and make foreigners feel uncomfortable by saying, how dumb are you? You can't eat with your hands. See, okay. this is, uh, the, the, the saying was, uh, it was a Persian emperor who said that, you know, eating with a fork and knife is like making love through an interpreter. <laughs> so, you know, it was things like this where, you know, you charm them with a certain grace mm. and you overwhelm them. Right. And you build contacts. And, you know, till Indira Gandhi's time also, our ambassadors in DC were very, very good. When you read Henry Kissinger's White House years when he's dealing with the 71 war, uh -huh. you see what a fantastic job our ambassadors were doing in that country by manipulating the press. Mm. In those days, the government was against us. The press was with us. I see. These days, the press is against us. The government is kind of... Uh, kind of with us okay. uh, Biden you never really know mm. I mean what he thinks today he forgets within 15 seconds so uh, uh, whatever but um, they could do that mm. but since liberalization and this whole middle class creation you look at the intake in there it isn't you're not going to be taught charm mm. you know you can't be taught grace you can't be taught sophisticated conversation you can't be taught uh you know, how to appreciate art and charm them. You can't be taught Indian art history to act as an ambassador for you abroad. Mm. Um, and even the subject matter training of bureaucrats is non-existent. Mm. So professionally or socially or aesthetically, it's non-existent. Mm. Uh, what do you do with a foreign service like that? Mm. Um, has Jay Shankar fixed any of it? Has he gone to the root causes? No. Mm. Uh, so far as I see in... Uh, Modi won one important thing that got sorted out was, like I said, all the activity, the mm. visits and things, jiska kota bara pada tha, which the previous government had ignored, which was completed. Mm. Once that was done, you needed the institutional reforms, mm. you needed the human resource reforms, which is the training and all of that, um, and you needed uh, uh, a clear course setting and uniform application. Not JNU application in silos to your bureaucrats, but uniform application of what the mindset of the government is onto the bureaucrats. Mm. Instead, what we get is a foreign minister who thrives on 10 second clips on Twitter being very smart. Thankfully, he's not being abrasive like Krishna Menon. He's not pissing off people. But, you know, if you think foreign policy is the sum total of and you have a very... Uh, goofy spokesperson who really can't, who ends up sinking your case more than defending you more often than not. So, you know, it's, uh, I don't know what to do. Hmm. Have you ever heard anything profound come out of Jai Shankar? Has he ever contextualized anything in a way nobody else has? Has he laid out a pathwork or framework? Have you ever gotten clarity on what India's foreign policy is? I wonder. See, uh, nobody can rec recollect. Mm. What is the Jai Shankar doctrine? Nobody can recollect. Mm. Uh, Narsama Rao had a vision. Mm. Atal Bihari Vajpayee had a vision. What mm. is this government's vision? You know, Vishwaguru is not a vision. Vishwaguru is on the vision, for sure. And it's disappointing because coming from the service, he should have known what all is required. Okay. And it mm. wasn't sound clips. Mm. What do you think of the Biden administration? Who do you think is running the US? I mean, clearly Biden is not competent to manage himself, let alone the country. Kamala Harris is incompetent. We can see that. 
Uh, so, so who's running the country? Recently, we saw this news news uh, report that the Pentagon blocked the White House from sending a dossier to the International Criminal Court, which kind of tells you that the Pentagon is more powerful than the White House. So who's really running the nation? In that instance, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, as I understand it, there are several different silos mm -hmm. uh, competing for power. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of crossed wires and crap happening out there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a power struggle. Because you don't have a coherent president. Yes. And you have a joke of a vice president. Yes, right. Uh, nobody takes Kamala seriously. Mm, nobody does. I mean, if you hear her, she seems almost as schizophrenic as her uh, boss. She, she sounds drunk at times. Um, she sounds drunk at times. Yes. Uh, most of the times. Actually. Most of the time. <laughs> uh, it's, it's the miraculous day when she sounds not drunk. Mm, right. Uh, but uh, uh, she's there. And uh, when you're president and vice president are people who simply can't hold fort. Um, this is what happens. Mm. It's a government without direction working in silos. Mm. That's what it is. What do you think of China? Uh, is Xi Jinping doing the right things? Is he taking the nation in the right direction? Or has he grabbed too much power and become the emperor? And uh, who do you think is going to be eventually going to replace him? Xi Jinping is doing all the right things for India. Okay. I don't know if he's doing all the right things for China. Okay. So I pray for Xi Jinping. Okay. I only pray for two people. Mm. Well, three people, but four. Uh, my two dogs, mm -hmm. my one cat, mm -hmm. Mohammed bin Salman mm -hmm. and Xi Jinping. Okay. And, you know, there's... Uh, I tweeted this back sometime. India's great luck is... India's great strategic liability is Modi's ego. Mm -hmm. And India's great strategic strength is Xi Jinping's stupidity. Okay. Uh, of course, stupidity has a risk. Now, Xi Jinping has destroyed all the checks and balances that Deng Xiaoping had built up in yes. China. Yes. Uh, he's turned it into a state. You know, before when we used to go to Beijing, the formal sessions, you'd get bullshit. The informal sessions, when we'd go out for dinner or chill out over drinks and things like that, then we would have serious conversations, no crap, and messages would be very clearly telegraphed to you. There would be dissent in private. Mm. And it was tolerated, it was encouraged in private. Okay. Never in public, in private. Feel free to disagree with Jiang Zemin, free, free to disagree with Hu Jintao, do what you want. Hmm? Hmm. Never see to it, it becomes public because it's a question of discipline. Yes. But in private, uh, you can talk to the Indians, you, you can express uh, whatever you want. Since Xi Jinping came, the private conversations have become stunted. I see. Hmm. Uh, they're just too scared because you don't know what you're going to be, when you're going to be taken away for what. Hmm. Uh, because, you know, he's destroyed the Guanxi system. The Guanxi sy system is no longer functional. Hmm. Uh, he's uh, 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 sort of made it all around himself and his cult of personality. Yes. He's uh, defenestrated the military. Before mm. the military had a huge... Uh, before, you know, uh, I mean, nobody takes the Chinese foreign ministry seriously. All the decisions used to get made in military headquarters and sent over to the foreign ministry simply to implement. Mm. Today, that's not the case because the military has also been culled quite badly. Military commanders are kept off balance. They keep getting shifted from military command to military command to military command. Mm. Today... An air defense artillery officer will tomorrow be posted to paratrooper. Paratrooper will be posted to logistics so that they don't gain powers like a feudal lord. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. So there's great dysfunction out there. Uh, there is uh, 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 the problem when you can't have an honest conversation in private is you have a lot of bad inputs and decision making. People are telling you what you want to hear, not what you need to hear. Mm -hmm. And that is therefore for me a lovely thing. Right. I wish more of Xi Jinping on the Chinese. Mm. Uh, the problem, of course, is the room for error, grave miscalculation, mm. increases exponentially when you have a leader like that. Right. It's like Hitler in the bunker only listening to reports that he wanted to listen to, not what he needed to listen to. Mm. I don't know who's going to replace Xi Jinping, but I don't think Xi Jinping is going anywhere for the next 20, 30 years. He's not even going to step down and hand over to Xiang Zemin and still be the paramount leader in the back like Tan Xiaopeng mm. did. Uh, I think he's going to be in charge, charge uh, for as far as we can see. Right. How do you see the future of Pakistan? I mean, Pakistan is permanently in chaos right now. Imran Khan, that, that whole situation is happening. The nation is nearly bankrupt. 
How long do you see Pakistan existing? Do you see it fragmenting at some point in time? Personally, I don't. Okay. I, I don't because I think we underestimate the ruthlessness of the Pakistan military and the determination to keep things together. Hmm. Uh, and we've seen this, that, you know, when some states disintegrate, they double down on ideology. North Korea being a classic example. Hmm. Uh, no matter what happens to Pakistan, it can't get as bad in the food situation as North Korea. Though, mind you, North Korea was way ahead of Pakistan. North Korea was a fully developed country. Hmm. Till 1979, North Korea was the success story. South Korea was the failure. Okay. Till 1979, North Korea had the second highest per capita income in Asia after Japan. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, China was a beggar. South Korea was a beggar. Hmm. So, only in 1979, that South Korea overtook North Korea. Hmm. Very recent memory, right? Hmm. Uh, So, that... Uh, So you can't compare, but you see how the North Koreans doubled down on ideology Mm -hmm. when things started going bad for them. Mm -hmm. Pakistan will double down on ideology. I think the Pakistan army has a very high uh, loss acceptance rate for non-army people. Mm -hmm. Marne though, but the ideology of Pakistan, as they call it, must continue. Okay. Because, of course, they're not going to die. They all have their homes in Boston and London and Dubai and wherever, Mm -hmm. or Abu Dhabi or whatever. Mm -hmm. But... um, it's quite easy for them to do. So I don't think we'll see that situation come to pass. As much as we will salivate over it, mm. I don't think we'll see mm. it come to pass. Where do you see India being in 2050? I, I clearly, I mean, Vishwaguru is, is some, I mean, that that's something we need not aspire for. And even the superpower status is kind of impractical. So where do you see India being in 2050? No different from where we are today. Okay. We'll be having the same conversations, facing mm. the same problems. In 2015, you'll definitely have a different prime minister who will mm. also be doing uh, Make in India and Vishwaguru. Different formulation, of course. It will be uh, 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 Universe Guru or mm. Galaxy Guru. Okay. <laughs> and it will be uh, 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 what... Uh, uh, um, it won't be Make in India. It will be Construct in India. Some crap like that. But... I don't see us solving our fundamental problems and leapfrogging. How does one solve these fundamental problems? Do we need to, co- to completely change the way the governance structure is uh, structured? What do we need to do? What's the uh, solution? So, you know, first let's understand what our problem is. Hmm. One is the education problem I spoke to. Yes, totally. Hmm. Now, to get to the basic manufacturing level, that to produce a factory floor worker in this, at a Chinese level or a Vietnamese level of production, you need to invest about, uh, let's say, uh, $1,000 per year per student. Hmm. So about 80,000 80, rupees per student per year uh, in a single language education. Hmm? Who's going to bell that single language cat? Yes. Who's going to allocate 1000 per student per education? Now, 12 years of study plus three years of either trade training or a bachelor's degree. Mm. Uh, If it's a BSc, it becomes much more expensive because the materials and things required for chemical experiments and physics experiments and things like that. Yes. Uh, At that tertiary level of training and things like that, you require about $10,000 a year minimum. Mm. The total education bill then per year, uh, assuming it's 13 million people joining the workforce every year, which is the last figure, even assume it's half of that, say mm. 7 million. At 13 million, your education budget becomes something like five to 600 billion mm. per year. Per year. To achieve just a China level of workforce. Mm. Do you have that money? No. Do you, uh, 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 even at 7 million, it's about 300 billion. Do you have that money? Mm. You don't. We don't. So what do you do? You go in for the sort of Swiss education system, which was teaching those uh, shepherds on the hills mm. who would spend six months up in the hills and then come down and learn. You do apprenticeship from the 10th or 11th standard on, even before that, mm. because the $1,000 per student is affordable. Mm. It's expensive, but it's still affordable as opposed to the secondary is what kills you. Mm. So what you do instead is you go in for a urban renewal program. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right now, Delhi is extraordinarily fuel inefficient. It's an, any Indian city mm. is fuel inefficient. It's energy inefficient. It is space inefficient. Yes. Delhi, technically, if you build 60, 70, 80 story high rises, can be brought down to 10% of its size 
with huge parks and a much higher standard of living with say double glazed windows mm. because you're a socialist country you do what singapore does assume every house is a 49 year lease convert right now you know in south delhi or north delhi wherever you're only allowed to build four floors okay very badly shaped plots mm. you make it even out the size make it 18 and uh, economic is 40 yeah, 40 50 60 becomes slightly more expensive mm. i mean exponentially more expensive still doable mm-hmm. still you start training the workforce for that right now the resistance to becoming a tradesman every tradesman's son wants to become a, the next bill gates yes is that you show them that there is good money to be made you mm-hmm. train them on the job and this is what happened to our workforce in dubai we get all the third rate workforce here our trained workforce goes to dubai and works on construction there okay so you do the dubai on the job training where you have basic literacy in one language uh you do that you then create economies of scale in construction material hmm. uh things like oven central air conditioning in every house which reduces uh your energy consumption massively double glazing which reduces energy loss massively hmm. Hmm. the shrinking of the size of delhi to 1/10th its size which uh, reduces your fuel costs it improves the uh density of your public transport system and makes it much much cheaper to run hmm. and much more efficient to run hmm. uh you create massive economies of scale just doing that to one city then start expand and the moment people realize it will be very unpopular in the beginning hmm. but the bjp can do this because all seven constituent all seven lok sabha constituencies tend to vote for kejriwal hmm. so treat it as punishment for 5 years build it up quickly <laughs> in 5 years hmm. and then by the fourth year hmm. the quality of life would have improved so much hmm. and you know quality of life improvement is something you feel instantly you're going from a house where you have you're scared to turn on the ac because of electricity bill to where it's natural and your electricity bill is low because you're saving so much because of double glazed windows and solar panels and uh central air conditioning mm. it you're happy mm. i mean even low income housing you can make fantastic high rise low income house mm. okay uh do that do that so you lose some votes you will gain a lot more votes right <clears throat> if you execute it properly i mean if you get an ias officer it's not going to happen right yes understand mm. if you leave it to most delhi builders who are all bloody crooks dlf or mr or whatever they're all crooks without exception i mean they're all third rate uh by global standards uh nahi hoga but do it in a good way uh plan it well mm. uh, definitely not cpwd and crap like that central public work department is even worse mm. i would any day take a delhi builder over the cpwd uh, quality uh you create that kernel you expand it to other cities you're creating an industrial revolution right you're bypassing the need for that education that high end education system you're creating a factory floor workforce through training in certain things you're creating the wealth you're creating the savings to then start investing in you you're bringing the respectability into being a factory floor worker mm okay mm-hmm. you're getting people used to the fact that aapka son bill gates nahi banega mm mm-hmm. or sundar pichai or whatever satya nadella nahi banega and mm-hmm. then you take it slowly slowly steps by step there defense acts as a very very important in this because if your construction you know building ovens and stoves for your houses which is actually Uh, co- getting consistent quality in that is a chore you have to train your workforce for it hmm. uh, doing prefab uh, uh, co- girder based construction here we do cement pillar construction yes. in the west it's all girder high, high rise is all girders metal girders with prefab uh, panels in between it's not brick hmm. right uh, it's that steel frame with uh, cement uh, powder cement uh, powder stone or whatever uh, 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 this thing uh, you do that because that is skilled unlike mm. brick laying which is not skilled mm. so you do that uh, you then that is your low end workforce the assembly of the ovens and stoves becomes your lower middle end workforce defense becomes your high end workforce mm. because if you look at the saab production line of the gripen mm. they don't have a separate quality control manager they increased everybody's pay that the next guy in the production line first quality checks your work and then he does his work and then his work is checked by the next guy in the production line. okay mm. so you can actually and you know israeli missiles they are not made by factory floor workers they're mm. made by engineers in those israeli factories mm, right right so you bring back a certain dignity of labor mm. you have to get your managerial workforce to get their hands dirty you mm. have to see to it that in a management schedule unless mandated by law unless a manager 
it doesn't matter who you are uh, adani ambani kirloskar uh, uh, tata whatever unless you've worked on the factory floor as a basic factory floor worker for 3 to 5 years you do not get promoted period mm. you can't uh, inherit shares you can't be on the board you can't be diddly squat mm, right okay you mm. do that there ha- there is a need for dignity of labor in this country which we don't have mm-hmm. right you do that and then you defense becomes your high end you know getting and then simultaneously of course you have to solve your regulatory problems mm. you know 90% of our regulatory uh, of investment not coming in india has to do with your judiciary and your regulatory problems that you're so confused mm. that every year taxes change cesses change levies change rules change uh, each one is applicable at a different point of time there is no predictability uh, one judge will say one thing like you saw what chandrachud did with zubair and what he did with that guy who was wanted by the tamil nadu police no mm. with zubair in spite of seven people getting killed it was you're a journalist how can i stop you even from tweeting hmm Uh, when it comes to the bihari guy who was talking about the bihari uh, this thing in um, uh, tamil nadu hmm. like, how dare you go around doing this in a sa- stable state like tamil nadu uh, jail go to jail okay so you know we we don't have one supreme court we have 14 15 supreme courts because each each bench hmm. is schizophrenic it thinks differently you can get diametrically opposite results depending on the bench i see so there is no rule of law in this country it's a joke hmm. and okay. this is the biggest worry about investors that there is no predictability on how the courts will rule if there is an industrial dispute right yes. there is no clarity on land registry mm-hmm. there is no quality control there is no assurance of contract delivery you focus on that instead of running all these idiot schemes all around uh, uh, you know focus on things like that mm. do police reforms concentrate your money where it counts urban development will look after a lot of other things you focus on security and regulatory hmm. uh, almost go back to an arthashastra like minimalist approach to government hmm. which was what we were promised remember minimal hmm. government maximum governance yes it's become the reverse uh, but well that was the promise uh, do that there there are ways of, it's not easy hmm. it's, it's not easy, easy. yeah you can do it mm. uh, if you plan it very very carefully if you do your quality selection very very carefully it is possible to do it okay uh, the question is do we have the guts to do it do we have a leadership that has the guts to do it so this is a top down thing it has to come top down right all changes are top down top down yeah. uh, i don't care what our audience reads in these online modules about bottoms up peace approach mm. and bottoms up nation building approach mm. it's all humanities based bullshit it mm. has never worked all major serious change has always been top down right right uh what do you think of the wokeism pandemic that's sweeping the world why do you think the west is coming up with this thing that's destroying their own society and now they're exporting it worldwide including to india they've run out of problems mm. so they're creating problems so they're creating problems where none exists mm. you know this is like uh you know uh basically is assume i'm your employee mm. you found me in a very bad state you paid for all my medical things but uh-huh. now i've gotten used to taking four days off a week instead right okay so you then come and say ki uh bhai abhijit ab to tum theek ho gaye ho come work 5 days a week like everybody else huh. sir you know i have psychology now i've suddenly invented a psychological problem mm. sir i'm in deep depression sir then you send me to a psychiatrist all the reports come out i still say sir i don't think the psychiatrist good sir okay then you uh, procure me um antidepressants and things illegally uh let's sort it out Oh you abused me. Mm. I want a 5 million dollar settlement. Yes. This is what is happening out there but this is classic left. Mm. Yes it is. They create divisions where none exist. Yes. They create social fissures where none exist yes. because what they do is they prey on the weak. They are the worst kind of parasites. Mm. They will create a victim where no victim exists. They will make you feel like a piece of shit. Mm. So that you join them. Mm yes. it is a coalition of gripe it is a coalition of failure it is a coalition of uh 
uh, essentially revisionism. Hmm. Hmm? Uh, of course, they'll give it all their technical jargon and claim you are the revisionist and we are the actual protagonist or whatever. Yes. But this is what they do. Hmm. And you know, this is one of the great ironies of nature, isn't it? That um, America thought it defeated communism when the USSR fell. Hmm. And what the communists did was that they dumped the body of Russia and like a demonic possession, <laughs> they went and possessed American scholarship. Yes. And it's been one of those latent, uh, you know, like a tapeworm. Mm. It takes years before you understand that you have a tapeworm problem. Decades sometimes. Decades sometimes. Uh, so it's like eating raw pork and getting tapeworm, mm. where the tapeworm has finally gotten to the brain. They did a slow academic capture. Yes. Then they uh, did an institutional capture. Mm. And now, you know, there's no going back from here now. It's too, I, it's too far gone. The rot is too deep. The cancer yeah. has spread. There is no amount of chemotherapy that can... They will destroy America. Let's be very clear about yes. it. Mm -hmm. uh, they will destroy America. There is no fight back because I think the right, it's a very valiant fight. I admire my friends for fighting. Mm -hmm. But they're fighting a rare guard. They're fighting, you know, the last stand. Once you open the borders and let that's people rush in, that's it. That's the end of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, the kind of scamsters that are being employed, you know, the uh, 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 the chronically unemployed, you have to have DEI training, hmm. diversity, yes. uh, 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 something, bullshit, diversity, something training. Bullshit, uh, yeah. diversity training. Yeah. You now need to have certification for everything, otherwise it won't be. And now companies also have to sponsor all this. And mind you, do you know why all the companies have gone along with this? Do you remember what happened to Nokia? Because this happened in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. I don't know if all our audience, our audience might be quite young. But when we were growing up, I still remember when I first saw a Nokia phone and I was yeah. like, oh my God. Yes. And it was like a big phone. Remember, mm. they were like this big and they were quite heavy. They used to be 1.1 kilos or 1.2 <laughs> kilos or something like that. Mm. And it used to look like an idiot. I mean, in those days you used to look like very cool because there was lack, uh, it, it, in those days it used to cost 1.2 lakhs. I think the entry level model was 80,000 rupees and mm. things like that. It used to go around talking on it. Mm. They became smaller, better, better, better. And then boom, Nokia vanishes within our lifetime. Yes. We have seen absolute world dominance by a company and that company being snuffed out pathetically within our lifetime. Yeah. Hmm? Uh, that is what technology replacement does. Hmm. So what companies have realized is, uh, and all of this happened with freedom of expression, where church and dogma and state were, uh, not state, but church and dogma were beaten back. Hmm. You could be heretical. You could be blasphemous. Yes. That is the root of in all uh, uh, innovation. Hmm. That is where the great scientific revolution happened in the West and that is where the industrial revolution happened because of that and that is why the West dominance came about. Yes. It was because of the Reformation. and uh, The Reformation was a starting process. Of course, M M Martin Luther was an even worse bigot than the Pope <laughs> at the and that's a different matter. Hmm. But that's how it starts off. What happens in this process is, so what happened there is that you have this whole freedom of the mind hmm which brings about innovation. Yes. It could not happen in the dark ages. Why? Because everything was controlled by dogma. Yes. And conflict. Yes. Small feudal states constantly fighting each other. You had no idea of where life was. And mostly you had a overweening church that would burn you alive for heresy or witch hunts or whatever crap. Yes. They are bringing in that thought policing again. Mm. Hate speech is the first Attempts at thought policing, taking you back to the 7th century, the 8th century, the 9th century, the 10th century. Because when you're terrorized, you can't innovate. Yes. And so the companies that are dominant today will always remain dominant because mm. the general rate of innovation will come down. Mm. It is also a fantastic management tool because your team will not be able to innovate and replace you. They will constantly be looking to suck up to you because you never know when you will get accused of me too or she too or whatever nonsense or uh, a thought crime or a racial thought crime or gender thought crime. So you are so scared. You just want to get to work. You want to do your work and you want to get out of work. So it's fantastic for F grade managements who don't want to see boardroom coups. 
It is fantastic for corporations as a whole and their shareholders to prevent in the rapid to slow down the rate of innovation so that they don't become obsolete and don't face a Nokia-like situation. If you technically look at it, it's a fantastic tool of social control. Yes. The problem is in the process of social control, you have lost America. Yeah. And everything that made America great. Best of luck to you. And now they're exporting it worldwide. I mean, we have we are seeing the first uh, beginnings of this in India as well now, right? It, it's never going to come into India. Okay. Uh, you've got some trash who uh, do this kind of crap. Hmm. Um, have you seen them get any traction? Not yet. Not thus far. But it, we are seeing these. Uh, we are it seeing... won't because these are first world problems. We hmm. have enough real problems to oh. have these Im- uh, to go on to these imagined problems. Hmm. Once we reach about thirty, forty thousand dollars per capita, yeah, uh, then. I see a great danger of this bullshit coming here. But mm. remember, all of this crap actually started in France. It was called the <laughs> Soissons whatever. Uh, it was people like, uh, who was it? Andre Foucault? Gide or Foucault? Foucault. Foucault. Who was a dirty child molesting <laughs> yeah, piece of true. shit. Totally. A sick, dirty fellow who should have been castrated and uh, guillotined. Uh, but France is very smart. Mm. When they find these 66 pedophiles, all of whom are thought leaders, mm. uh, they export them to America. Yes. And uh, they spread their rot there. Mm. And Americans being trusting creatures, oh, look at these fancy little French people coming here and talking to us and all funny jargon. And, you know, oh, my God, that sounds so sweet. It's not a croissant. It's a croissant. And, oh, my God, that's so cute. And, oh, my God. I didn't understand a word of what you said, but I love listening to you talking to you in my French, uh, your funny French, sexy French accent. Da, 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 da. It becomes the theory out there. It mm. becomes fantastic. And mm. in time the Soviet Union falls, you find the perfect new victim card to play. Fusion of toxicity. To this day, mm. the one country that it has not touched in the developed world is France. Yes, right. Because the France, the French are very clear about their first principles. You know, France is the only country where the left accuses the right of not being uh, 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 secular enough. Mm. You know, they're like, uh, you are, it was the left that was accusing Marine Le Pen of pandering to Islamists saying you're not being hard enough on them. Okay. All right, Mélenchon mm. mm-hmm. was accusing Marine Le Pen. Mm-hmm. Normally, it is the other way. So the other way around, yeah. Uh, but here, every French politician, because of the way what I said, a foreign, uh, our foreign service needs to be trained up. Mm-hmm. Those schools, those French bureaucratic schools are so good. Those first principles and the applications of thought. Mm-hmm. What the Israelis do to a military problem, the French do to a sociological problem. Mm. The French are the Israeli, uh, what the Israeli military is to problem solving, to military problem solving and technology problem solving, the French are to humanities problem solving. Mm. They identify rotters and kick them out. They, uh, 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 they know their first principles. They know how to train their things. You will never see this bullshit come in France. Right. So they're very clear about that. Mm. Uh, We need to build that kind of a French system. See, they're very clear on their principles of secularism. They're very clear on their laws. Mm. They never violate their laws. They always stick within that. They know what laicite means. In India, we still don't understand what dharma nirpaksh means. Right, yes. Mm. Um, So it's... uh, I'd say the French model is a fantastic model, mm. at least in bureaucracy training. Let's get the French down. Let's get a whole lot of retired French bureaucrats to train up our bureaucrats at any rate. Mm. You know, I had a French bureaucrat studying with me in Australia. Every six months he'd be flown and he had still not joined the bureaucracy because he was finishing his bachelor's degree, but had been selected for the intake. Okay. Every six months he'd be flown back to Paris, mm-hmm. even before he had joined, mm-hmm. to do pre-starting courses and things like that. That is the amount they invested in their bureaucrats. bureaucrats. Mm. And the bureaucrats are very down to earth. You'll never get a bureaucrat who says, Sandeh, you know my father's uh-huh. mm. uh, Coming back to India, what do you think of the situation in, no- in the Northeast? The, the, the Manipur situation, Manipur is still aflame kind of. What do you think is the root cause of this? Largely the free hand that was given to Christian missionaries to go there and spread their bile. Indeed. Mm. Mm. Uh, because, you know, the problem is uh, the West seems to think of all Christianity as being first world Christianity. Mm. 
first world Christianity in Italy and America is very nice, you see. Mm. Your uh, local priest is kind of your local community counselor. Yes. You have a problem when he's not abusing your kids. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. You you go to him, you have a chat with him, he'll provide counseling services, he'll help you get through things. He's more like a support mechanism. Mm. Third world Christianity is not like that. Mm. Third world Christianity is the Christianity that goes around burning witches. Yes. Burning albinos. Remember a lot of the albino burnings in Africa. Africa, is, yes. Uh, is sanctioned by the church. Mm. All the gay killings in Africa are sanctioned mm. by the church. Mm. Several churches. And people don't want to talk about this, but uh, in the Northeast, several witches are killed every year. I see. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's never reported as such, but they are killed every year. Wow. Mm. Okay. It's a very nasty, mean, land-grabbing thuggery, the way feudal uh, Christianity was at one point of time, 7th century, 8th century, 9th, 10th, 11th, whatever uh, Christianity was. Um, so you're never going to be able to make that point there. And now the damage is done. All the diversity of that area has been destroyed. It's all been homogenized into different churches. Their identity, their traditional identity is all gone. It is now consolidated around linguistic identity and re mostly religious identity because, you know, the church has been given a free hand to provide all kinds of services which nobody else is allowed. Well, the Muslims also have that free hand. They just don't invest. And, you know, Indian com uh, Hindu communities, the first thing when they, a Christian, when they get money in India, they set up a school. Mm. Uh, a Hindu, when they get money, they set up an ugly modern temple and do bhajan kirtan classes there where all the aunties are singing in the most awfully, god-awful, off-tune, bad-tune bullshit. Okay? Uh, they catch them young. Mm. That is one of the main root causes. The second root cause is we ourselves have impoverished that area. Mm. You know, yes. in a sense, it's like Kashmir. Mm. You have created an island saying, oh, ethnic identity, ethnic identity, ethnic identity. Mm. People don't realize that the Northeast is exactly the same problem as Kashmir. This mm. island mentality, which you need to break through greater integration, mixing, etc., 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 which is simply not happening out there. You create, you know, urbanization has a great... Uh, uh, homogenization tendency which we tend to ignore mm. so you need more urbanization not ghettos more urbanization more production more industrialization which you know make them feel a part of the Indian whole yes um, I think those would be the main things I think Manipur was actually going in that direction since 2017 I, you can see the city of Imphal really Progressing, it was. prospering. It was. And then this happens. And then this happens. Yes. You see, well, th this is what happens. Right. So it looks like it's more of a geopolitical thing. Maybe there's foreign interference in this? I don't think there's foreign interference in this. I personally feel this is something on which we... Uh, uh, we didn't read the signs. You know, we tend to ignore the Northeast. Mm, we do, yes. Uh, very much. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost like it doesn't count. Hmm. Uh, how much TV attention did you see given to the Manipur situation? Nothing. 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 Uh, everyone ran one uh, uh, token news item for two minutes yeah. and one token article. Yeah. And after that, it's still going on. It's still going on, uh, as we speak. Nobody's reporting about it. Nobody is. Uh, you know, when uh, Congress didn't think it was going to go their way, they said, okay, election's over. Can we now focus on Manipur mm. just to divert because they thought... Mm. And then BJP said, can we now focus on Manipur when the elections weren't going that way? But after uh, six, seven hours, they're like, okay, let's, can we talk about what next? Yeah. Um, let's throw shit at the Congress. Congress says, let's throw shit at the BJP. So a lot of it is, uh, you know, I think we tend to ascribe motives when we don't want to accept our own failures. Mm. And, you know, this is a very woke thing to do. You aren't responsible for your feelings. Society is responsible. Society Did is. you see that r ridiculous exchange between Pierre Polivier and the Financial Times correspondent? I haven't. Oh, God, it's on my timeline. Go check it out. Okay. It's the most bizarre exchange you will ever see. And he's basically for serial uh, criminals who are committing 60 to 70 crimes every year. Mm -hmm. He's blaming society <laughs> for their criminality. Okay. Mm. And Pierre Polivier actually calls him out and says, are you dumb? Mm. Are you mad? Are you being serious? Uh, and the guy doesn't get it. And he typically is a Financial Times correspondent. I mean, what do you expect <laughs> from the left and right testicles of Gideon Rahman? Mm. Right, right, right. Right, so this... Uh, this all or this Ed Luce, whoever. I mean, they're both morons, but anyway. Mm. <laughs> 
Right, so there's, there's all this happening in the Northeast. What do you think is the importance of the Northeast for India? It's kind of our gateway to Southeast Asia, right? It is, but I think it's more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't look very different. Like even a Kala Madrasi like me, mm -hmm. and a Gora Punjabi <laughs> like you. Uh, you see, originally the Tamils are not uh, Dravidians. We didn't come from... Uh, we are not Semitic people who moved here. Okay. The DNA study showed that we came from Burma. So we're the original Manipuris. Okay. Okay. Bengalis are also Khmer Mon extraction. Khmer Mon. Mm. Which is why, you know, Mamta Banerjee looks like Boris Yeltsin. <laughs> kind of looks like... I mean, you see that with a lot of Bengalis. Yes. So I'm technically Burmese. Mm. Thai Burmese. Mm -hmm. And you are a uh, Aryan invading Middle. Aryan. Yes, of course. But we look very different. Mm. No, I mean... We look very similar. We look quite similar. Overall. Overall. I mean, yeah. other than the fact I'm three times your circumference. <laughs> but um, the Northeast is that one population that is linguistically, uh, culturally to an extent, but uh, ethnically very different from us. Mm. It is crucial to the idea of a multi-ethnic, multi-indo-cultural Hindu civilizational state, not India, a Hindu civilizational state, which for me is what India should be. And that is its importance. It's mm. a very theologically and theological, I mean, not in the religious sense, but in the, uh, you know, the theology of the idea of India, if you want. Such a terrible term. I mean, the idea yeah. of Pakistan just ruined it for everybody, hasn't it? Um, but uh, it's very important that way. Uh, Geostrategically, can we do without it? Sure. But if you... If such a large ethnicity breaks away from you, mm. it then comes down to who's different next. And then it's just a race to the bottom. To kala hai, to gora hai, mm. he'll separate. Right. Recently we heard, I think it happened yesterday, that Kiran Rijuju was removed as the law minister and he's been given some other ministry. It's being portrayed as a punishment posting of, of sorts. Is the, do you think that has something to do with what's happened in the Northeast, the recent uh, trouble? I don't think it has anything to do with the Northeast. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been lots of salacious crap going around, mm. especially by alleged fact checkers mm. who are putting out uh, essentially gossip as fact. What's been happening there, as I understand it, is that this new guy, Meghwal, Ar Arjun Meghwal, he doesn't open his mouth, but he's extraordinarily ruthless. Kiran Riju is a very affable character. Mm. He's a very friendly, kind, warm person. Mm. Here, they basically, uh, uh, to use a Soviet analogy, uh, uh, Kiran Riju is the student youth komsomol, and uh, uh, the uh, 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 Meghwal is the Schmerzspionum division of the KGB. Okay. Uh, tasked with burning alive uh, uh, internal traitors. Mm. Mm? He's the Lavrenti Biria. Biria. Mm. So he's been brought in. Uh, it's a, actually a sign of hardening of attitudes towards the judiciary, not a softening of attitudes. Okay. Uh, it's also a sign that there's going to be no more talk. There's going to be action. He's ruthless. Mm. He's a go-getter. Um, he's fine. He has very old-fashioned views on gay people and all of that. But, okay. Mm -hmm. um, he's very cold and calculated and he's the sort of uh, ninja assassin. Mm. Now, I get this question all the time. How do you learn geopolitics? So, how did you learn geopolitics? I still haven't learned. It's a constant process. Yeah, right? I mean, but, but you are clearly an expert. So, does it have to do with, with studying history? It has to do with a lot of history and geography. Mm. Uh, the two exams that my parents never used to insist I study for were history and geography. I see. Achha, kal history hai, aaj cartoon dekh lo. Okay. Uh, kal geography hai, aaj cartoon dekh lo. Uh, because, and you know, English history and geography were the three books that even before school started, because, you know, we used to get the books about 10, 15 days before yes. uh, <coughs> school started. The parents would be called and they, they were given the school bag and the diary and all the books and notebooks and everything. Hmm. We would just be given, um, we would just be given uh, 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 all the books hmm. and I would finish the history, geography and English books before semester even started in those 15 days. 
you have to be voracious with history. And yes. you know, I realized, you know, my my history teacher's biggest complaint used to be my geography teachers never had an issue with me. Mm. My history teacher's biggest complaint used to be, Abhijit, please don't tell me more than what I've taught you. Okay. Just write <laughs> what the question says. Right. I know you know it, mm. but why are you writing all this extra stuff? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I didn't ask you why the War of the Roses broke out. Yeah. I just said what were the Lancastrian factions and the uh, 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 Tudor. Mm. Uh, what was it? It was Lancaster and the White Rose of something and the Red Rose. Anyway, whatever. And the Tudor Rose is the combination of the White and the Red. But anyway, uh, just answer that damn question. Don't give me a long analysis of uh, causes and this and that and blah, blah, blah. Uh, just do this. So it used to be passionate. My parents made me travel a lot as a kid, which then, you know, increased that sociological inquisitiveness. Right. Because you learn a lot through travel. Yes, you do. You learn a lot through food. Mm. Yes. yes. Uh, you learn a lot through just being a kid and interacting with normal people, not from five-star hotel to five-star hotel. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then what happened was, because my dad was in the defense ministry, he used to keep bringing back, I, I had a great fascination for planes and okay. ships and okay. machinery. And, you know, uh, in those days, you know, Delhi, uh, th there's a town called Bijvasan. We were talking about this, remember? Yes. Uh, next to Delhi Airport, which was this uh, very scary Gunda town. It was yes. a, uh, it was highwaymen central. But before that, uh, you know, there's this abandoned hotel now called the Centaur out there, which was the Air India Hotel. Okay. We used to go somewhere near there and watch landings. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned to identify aircraft engines because in those days, there used to be a lot more aircraft. There used to be McDonnell Douglas. Yes, DC-10s. DC-10s. There used to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, a lucky TriStar. Mm. Uh, there were all kinds of aircraft coming to Delhi in those days. Mm. Uh, and there was greater engine variety. There was mm. greater aircraft variety. It used to identify the shapes and things like that. And then when he when it was in the defense ministry, you know, he started getting back all these defense magazines, which I was like, oh, mm. technology. Oh, my God, this goes boom. That goes boom. It took a long time. Of course. And I still think I was a siloized guy when I finished my master's in uh, this thing inside my PhD and everything. Mm. Where my history and geography fed into all of this was when I joined ORF because my boss there, Samir Saran, he told me that, Abhijit, uh, I know I've hired you for defense, but for the first year, you're not going to do defense. I didn't hire you actually for defense. Mm -hmm. um, you basically know a lot of shit other than defense, which you have not categorized in your mind and you're not using it properly. Mm -hmm. So he said, you're going to work on education policy. You're going to work on health policy. You're going to work on IT policy. I was like, MC, BC, ye kya? what have I come to? I've given up a perfectly good job to come and this piece of shit, he's doing this, that, whatever, whatever to me. I was cursing him every day. I was coming home and crying and uh, Sameer Saran Marja, I would do uh, 100 pujas to Kali to see to it that Sameer Saran <laughs> dropped dead the next day or whatever. He's probably hearing this shit. I'm going to send him this clip. And he turned out to be my th third great mentor in life because mm. he taught me how industrial policy, education policy, food policy, all affect defense policy. So I was thinking in a silo. I wasn't able to answer certain questions. I thought, if we buy that and we buy that, it will be fine. And all the other stuff started clicking into place. Hmm. So, you know, for me, that was, I think that was a very, very important moment in the way I started processing all the knowledge I had learning to categorize that knowledge because, you know, sometimes there is information overload. Yes. Uh, you have to learn to sort of manage information in your mind. So, you know, instead of learning the micro detail, you get a bullshit meter where you know who's very, very good at the subject or uske charan pe bat ke seek lo. Mm. Mm. Uh, and what he developed in me was the bullshit meter and the ability to connect policy. Mm -hmm. Forced. Lots of tantrum throwing and crying and huge fights we'd have in uh, the ORF third floor. Okay. Uh, I'd throw things at him and he would throw things at me and call me names and I'd call him names and he'd screech in front of everybody. It's good to have a boss who'll tolerate that. See, it's a fantastic boss. I think mm. I've been blessed, even my current boss. Mm -hmm. I've yelled at him in front of the entire office and he's gone ballistic at me. I've always been blessed with really crazy, kooky, lovely bosses mm. and mentors who have who have never punished me for being a problem child. They've always said, this is a mental case, hai, mm. but um, 
इसको हम फिक्स कर सकते हैं और दे ऑलवेज वैल्यू एडिड टू तो दे माई गुरूज इन दैट सेंस एंड आई स्टिल स्क्रू अराउंड विद दम एंड कॉल दम नेम्स एंड थिंग्स राइट टू देर फेस बट दिस दैट फंडामेंटल रिस्पेक्ट एंड यू आई थिंक दैट्स द गुरु शिष्या परंपरा वेव ऑलवेज हैड यू नो दैट वन पर्सन और सेवरल वन पीपल कोचिंग दैट डायरेक्ट कनेक्ट यू हैव विद समबडी टीचिंग यू समथिंग expecting you to be better than them unselfishly not the inferiority complex ye mere se behtar nahi hona chahiye indeed yeah uh, encourage you to be even better hmm push you to be even better i have been blessed that way i had this discussion yesterday with uh, swapna sundari ji who's an who's a uh, odissi another I'm dancer a big fan of swapna sundari you know she used to be one of the big names she mm-hmm. then completely went off the dance scene but you know mm-hmm. she used to be one of those absolute top names like 15 20 years back yeah she is a fascinating uh, person and we have a extensive discussion it will come out on my channel and i hope to have another follow up discussion soon so we spoke about the concept of the guru the, what you mentioned and it's not about see today we we, we think of all teachers as our gurus yeah. that's clearly not the case not so the what's case. your idea of what a guru is someone who changes your life hmm. it's very clearly somebody who changes your life hmm. and you know it doesn't have to be the same thing it can be an act of kindness it can be an act of compassion it can be an act of understanding uh it can be an act of education mm. we tend to just narrow it down into education but yes. education comes in so many shapes and forms and something that changes your life profoundly mm. uh is uh for me a guru so you know there are many 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 of my teachers in school mm. who i consider my gurus there are a lot more teachers in school who i do not consider my gurus indeed uh there are lots of adult mentors that i've had ever since i entered adulthood uh, uh who i consider my gurus mm-hmm. so you know i've been blessed because a guru shishya relationship is a kindred relationship on both sides the guru sees something special in you and you see something special in them mm-hmm. and they end up changing your life for the better for me that it, it it is i think you know the west doesn't understand that it's, it does it's not. such a uniquely emotional philosophical thing in india uh i think we accept it and we respect it a lot more in this country because we have that theological framework whereas in the west i've seen it happen but they don't connect at that sort of spiritual level that a guru shishya does in india it's more transactional in the west it's much more transactional in the west and it's all about i mean there's this relationship in which you need to pay a teacher in, in india it's a guru is your guru for your life for life they are you can go back any time you can go back at any time anytime. you can demand whatever you can yes. throw whatever tantrum you can screech at your teacher yeah. पागल आ गया है चलो चलो सब भागो इधर से हाँ हाँ बेटा बोल 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 और फुटिया से जा एंड यू नो इट्स 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 अ वेरी इन इट्स नो लॉन्गर अ फॉर्मल इट्स फैमिली इट्स फैमिली it's family okay. yes. you know all the family members mm. you are invited to the children's wedding uh, their wedding everything you become part of the family mm. you are a crucial part of the family the family event can't happen without you you know it becomes mm. like that yeah uh which is something very very uniquely indian and you know those are the things i think so much more worth preserving in our culture mm, yes. you know the ideological frameworks the theological frameworks more than you know concepts of purity or whatever bullshit i think these are those true gifts to humanity which we have not understood are such valuable gifts to humanity mm. which we have never really understood ourselves or articulated as clearly and expounded as clearly mm. you speak about india and what why, why do you th- what do you think is the reason why india needs to keep existing what is what is valuable about india literally everything mm. uh you know the um, ability to be uh, a dirt poor country and still be extremely tolerant in our points of view mm. uh which should technically not be the case mm. uh to be so accepting of diversity to be so accepting of failure mm. uh to be so stoic in deprivation mm. and you know the thing is i've noticed the ability to care for each other is so much greater amongst the poor mm-hmm. than it is in the rich they look after themselves much better than we do 
uh, you know, I think as a kind of psychological device, we just cut ourselves off. Poor people help each other. Yes. Our thoughts, you know, our philosophy, mm. uh, our religion especially, mm. because everything is born from that religion. Yes. It's completely unique. There's nothing like it. And I wouldn't be a Hindu if I didn't fundamentally believe that it was, even though I'm a Charvak, I'm an atheist, mm. um, that it it's something worth living for and worth dying for. Yes. And one thing... Not I, worth killing for. Not worth killing for. For blasphemy and bullshit like that. Mm. But worth living for and worth dying for. India has suffered so many artificial famines. Mm. We never resorted to cannibalism. I think we did, no? We did. Must be uh, in one or two random isolated instances. I sure? do not. Okay. I think a little Look, in famine, you can't... You know, you it, there's nothing you can do. Right, right. I think there are lots of reports from Chiatar and Monitor. I think that was the 30, uh, 1824. Okay. Or the 36, I forget, uh, famine. There were massive instances of cannibalism. I see, I see. I wasn't aware of that. Right. But it, it has happened. Um, there's, look, it's, I think any famine breaks societies. Uh, yeah, it does. You know, I think the clearest case of how society breaks under poverty and deprivation is Bihar. Hmm. You know, Bihar, hmm. we all make fun of Bihar today. Hmm. Sab hai, ye hai, wo hai, gunde hai, uh, thag hai, ye hai. Blah, it used blah, to be blah. Magad, Patliputra, that same thing. Everything that was good and great about India came from Bihar. Indeed. Hmm. The Mauryas, okay, uh, Chanakya was from Takashila, but he grew and became Chanakya in Magadha. Yes. Hmm? Uh, the Guptas. The Guptas. Uh, your Kalidasa. Hmm. You know, all your philosophy, or not all, but most of your philosophy, most of your empires, the notion of India. Yes. You know, the crucible of the formation of Hinduism. Uh, the crucible of Buddhism. Hmm. Yes. Uh, the cru uh, a lot of it happens in Bihar. Yes. And it is the absolute epicenter hmm. of the 1857 revolt. It is, yes. Because that is where the feeling of nationhood was the strongest. Hmm. They, because they gave the idea of India to India. Hmm. Bihar is the mother from which ideologically, hmm. I may be Burmese and you may be Ukrainian, hmm. but ideologically, we are all the children of Bihar. Yes. And because that sense of being the mother of India was so great in Bihar, that is where the revolt of 1857 was the harshest. Mm. And the punishment was also the harshest. Mm. And within 20 years, India's most civilized state was reduced into India's most uncivilized state. You know, when you have no food to eat, mm. where your children are dying, you don't think about culture. You can't think about nationalism. Uh, where mothers are rubbing opium onto their... Uh, breasts to feed the child so that it keeps quiet. That That is the kind of deprivation you're looking at. It You know, it takes thousands of years to build up an ethos, a culture, a civilization. It takes a decade to destroy it. Yes. And that's what the British did to Bihar. Yes. Mm? Uh, Biharis were the most civilized people. Mm. We're all the children of Bihar. Mm. Does that mean I'll get some of my Bihari friends home right now? No, thank you. <laughs> but... Um, this is what happens. So, you know, famines are like that. Yes. They will destroy the fabric of society. Yes. So, you know, I mean, you can't judge people by what happens in extreme situations like mm. that. Yes. I think it's more normal situations of deprivation where we don't go berserk on blasphemy mm. and crap like that. Okay. My final question for you for today is what advice would you give to young people? Just general advice. Do what I say, don't do what I do. <laughs> but follow your dreams, you know. Mm. The basic thing is, if mommy is telling you, tujhe engineer banna hai, ya doctor banna hai, nahi toh fir toh ullu ka patha hai. Boss, just do your own thing. Because if you're passionate about something, you'll always find your way. But always ensure that you do your research and find that it actually has life opportunities. It's not like becoming an actor. Becoming an actor is not a profession hmm. okay it can be something on the side but find a profession that pays that you have a fallback on and find it in anything hmm. statistics history geography whatever all right thank you for a fascinating and very wide-ranging conversation thank that was so great much. fun i hope you really enjoyed this conversation and gained something of genuine value from it 
सब्सक्राइब नाउ थैंक यू एंड आल सी यू सून